So we're going to talk about a bunch of different things today. And for a large portion of the day, we're going to be um, practical. So I would like you guys to, to actually have the experience of opening a micro data set, learning how to load it, how to process it, those kinds of things. So in the morning... We did a survey yesterday, but maybe you guys didn't see your results. Who was going to have a micro data set? Ah, so I, I would have gotten to that in two seconds, so I'm going to do a hands-up survey in a second about that. Um, so I'm going to start off in the morning by telling you a fair bit of theory about things. We'll talk about um, basically first what is expression profiling, how it works, what are the critical um, factors that you need to consider. I'll then walk you through on screen showing you the analysis of how you would handle a sample experiment. So I'll have an R session open. I will take the questions and I'll go through the first three, four questions with you guys step by step showing you what I do, how I do it, why I do it in that particular way. I'm going to actually code it while we're talking. So it's not going to necessarily exactly match the solutions, and that's kind of the point. You're going to see it done twice, which is going to be really useful. At that point in time, and in the afternoon for the workshop, I'll set you loose on the remainder of the questions, and we'll walk around and help you when you get stuck with different questions. So, as Michelle guessed I was going to say, I wanted to get a feel for, for what you guys are working with. So how many of you are working uh, practically with microarray data at the moment? So, good half of the room. Okay. Um, how many are working with next gen sequencing good? So, uh, another group. And how many are working with something else, proteomics, metabolomics, or another type of omics data? So, a couple of people. All right. So, for the people who are working with micro data, um, how many of you would be saying that you're working with a data set of more than 100 arrays? Okay, a couple. All right, so for people working with large data sets, there are certain technical issues that we won't be discussing at all today. We're going to be focusing on issues that would mostly arise on smaller data sets. And, and one of the issues is simply computational power. The data set that you'll be working with was chosen so it can run on your computers. Um, and we can't run most 100 micro data sets on a, a local computer. Uh, and there's also time factors. So for large data sets, sometimes they take a couple of days for an analysis to complete. And that's probably impractical for the one-day workshop. All right. So we're in the first section. There's a couple of things that we're going to talk about. And, and the first thing I'd like to ask you guys is a question. What exactly does an mRNA microarray measure? mRNA microarray. So, uh, yeah, so what do you mean by mRNA? Um, messenger RNA is coming out of it. Okay. Okay, so does anybody want to expand on that? Messenger RNA from the cytoplasm of the cell. Most of them are polyadenylated. Usually. And why is that, do you know? For the pre-polyne. It's an easier way to grab it. Yeah, easier way to extract it. Good. And does anybody have something else? Yeah. I was just going to say the transfer products of reactions that are occurring at a particular tissue, mm -hmm. which are different according to what tissue you Yeah, so there's definitely tissue specificity. What else? Sorry? Yeah, so it's one of the critical things that we look at different levels. What else? A couple of critical factors. Yeah. So they actually compare expression between your sample of interest and uh, and I did miss a, this a reference yep so it's some sort of a relative yes. measure very good <laughs> anything else I think it measures the expression of the gene but not the the expression of the gene and it, it measures the, the fraction of the uh, messenger RNA how many genes pop up so it only measures a portion of the messenger RNA because not the entire thing is represented on the array Good. Anything else? And it's changing over time. It's not something fixed. Mm -hmm. So there's a temporal fraction. So, good. So when we say initially an expression microarray measures mRNA expression, it doesn't really do that. It measures a snapshot in time. It me measures a single tissue. 
it measures a fraction of the gene. And worse, if you take some of the most homogeneous tissues, say the liver, the liver is 90 odd percent hepatocytes, uh, but there's 10 percent of other cells, structural cells, stellate cells, edo cells, immune cells, blood, all running through the liver. And it only measures all of those cells pulled together and pooled in some sort of an average representation of a clump of tissue. It doesn't represent the entire transcript. It may not even catch all splice variants or all versions of it. And lastly, it's relative. It doesn't actually give you the absolute mRNA levels. It gives you something ref relative. And, and because of the way the technology works, we'll talk about in a second, uh, it's relative in a different way for every gene, so that you cannot trivially say this gene is more expressed than another. So those are a lot of limitations for a technology that's very widely used. Why is it so widely used then if it's got all these limitations? Because it's simple to measure in comparison with other uh, molecules, so they are like protein. So it's easier to do than measuring something like protein, definitely. Anything else? It's cheap. Yes, it's in Michelle. Yes, exactly. Um, it's just very cost effective. The equivalent of doing 20,000 PCRs is, this is one of the cheapest ways in which somebody can generate data in large quantities. All right, so that kind of gives you a hint of, of one of the limitations of the platform. I didn't ask, can anybody at the back hear me without me using the microphone? Yes, okay. So with those limitations in mind, we should talk a lot about what they actually, the microarrays actually are, how they work, and what the underlying sources of noise are. When you analyze any type of data as a bioinformatician, it's critical to know where the noise arises from. Because if you don't understand the technology itself, you can't understand how you need to model it in your computational procedures. And if you don't understand the computational modeling, you won't get your statistical analysis correct. So it all has to start off with an understanding of the technology and what are the potential sources of noise within that technology. So we'll talk a lot about what microarrays are and where potentially um, errors or problems can come up in microarray analysis. We'll talk about a little bit about what they're used for, um, particularly at the molecular level, but a little bit at the biological and downstream aspects. And then we'll talk in detail about the basic bioinformatic workflow for a microexperiment. It's a, a kind of a template that with modification would be useful for any microexperiment. And then we'll discuss in particular the Affymetrics template for one particular type of experiment and one particular technology. And we'll look at uh, how you'd apply that to your own analysis and own data sets. So for starters, defining a microarray is, is oh, let me lastly say, if you have a question, just stick up your hand and ask. I don't mind being interrupted. So underlying, a microarray is a technology that one of the most critical features is its multiplex. It's highly parallel. And you can describe it as sort of an ordered array of things. If it's a DNA microarray, it's an ordered array of DNA. Um, and each one is an oligonucleotide that can range in length from a small of maybe 20 base pairs to a large of uh, 20 or 30,000 base pairs. And there's a specific sequence in each of those spots on the array. It's generally used to either quantitate or to capture RNA or DNA. And in general... When you say DNA, you mean like nuclear DNA or something? So I'm getting there in one sec. Um, so in general, when we deal with RNA, uh, we normally reverse transcribe it into cDNA. And that allows you to have a more stable, more easily labeled uh, substrate. But there is definitely um, some arrays that will work directly on RNA. That's not, not unheard of at all. Uh, in terms of DNA, there's a number of things one can do. So one can use, and we'll talk about this in a second, but one can use um, DNA to measure SNPs by microarray. Or one can capture the DNA from certain regions of the genome using an antibody and hybridize that to an array to determine where the antibody was binding. That's called chip on chip. So there's a number of different techniques, but each of them rely on the fact that the microarray is a parallel method of measuring amounts of DNA or RNA. And so as long as you know the sequences, you can do just about anything that involves measuring RNA or DNA amounts. And in general, 
although not exclusively, microarrays are hypothesis-generating experiments. So what that means is that a microarray is a way of saying which genes are involved, which features are involved. You don't hypothesize feature X is involved. You hypothesize there are some features and let's figure out what they are and then we can go ahead and validate them and look at them in other ways. But it's not entirely true. The word usually there is, is for a good reason. For example, you may have a hypothesis that there is a biomarker for lung cancer. That's something that you would directly answer with a microarray. But in most versions of it, it's something to screen, to identify candidate genes or regions of interest. And just because it's a hypothesis generating experiment doesn't mean that you don't have to do experimental design. It actually makes it far more important to do good experimental design. And for all of you guys working as bioinformaticians, the most critical thing any micro experiment is that before you do the experiment, you think through the analysis. You say, all right, when I have this experiment, how would I do the analysis? Do I have the appropriate controls to normalize my data? Do I know that I'm going to have sufficient statistical power to discover the hypotheses that I'm interested in? Uh, do I even know which technology is better, which regions of the gene are most interesting? And of course, every company will come up with a, a very interesting and useful explanation of why technology is going to solve your problems. And you have to do a careful evaluation of which technology is best for which question. And sometimes that comes down to what you have skills or expertise with. So when it comes down to the experimental design, it's actually a challenging thing. And I would say that in good experiments, you spend almost as much time designing the experiment as you do doing the analysis. By the time you get down to the analysis, it becomes, not the first time you do it, but after a few times, relatively routine. You say, oh, I need to normalize the data using this technique. Here's a chunk of code that does that. I need to uh, do my statistical analysis using that technique. It's the evaluation and determination of those techniques that is time consuming. And that's one of the major things I want you to get out of today, is how can I do a good job of picking techniques and understanding what are the things that I need to think about. The other thing that, that really critically determines how an experiment works is the nature of the sample that you're using. For example, uh, you could have a sample that has never been frozen, that comes directly from a, a cell culture line or from an um, animal tissue, and that uh, directly gets RNA extracted and then is hybridized onto a microarray. That's good because the process of freezing down uh, tissue or RNA can damage it or degrade it. And so you'll see a definite difference in quality between samples that have never been frozen and samples that have been frozen. Similarly, large numbers of clinical samples are what are called FFPE fixed. Does uh, anybody know what FFP is? Yeah. So can somebody stick up a hand who wants to explain what FFP is used for? Yeah. It's, uh, it's paraffin embedded tissue. It's used for histology and mainly most samples are prepared. Yeah, so it's the standard way in which samples, clinical samples, are stored and maintained. There's an estimate that there's something like a billion FFPE blocks in the world, and it's basically taking the sample, um, fixing it in formalin, and embedding it into a wax paraffin, so formalin fixed, paraffin embedded. And this allows for long-term storage, and critically, long-term storage at room temperature. It's not as critical that an FFP block be frozen to minus 80 or something like that which greatly, greatly reduces storage needs and means that if your freezer goes down, you don't lose critical clinical samples. So FFPE studies are very interesting for a lot of reasons, um, but, but part because they represent rare clinical data sets, rare clinical tissue types. Uh, but the challenge is that in these tissues, the RNA is very greatly degraded. Even DNA can be substantially degraded. So you've got a quality continuum. And you can imagine in your experiment, if half your samples had never been frozen, and half had been formal and fixed, you'd have a systematic difference in your experiment. And if these happen to be all your interesting cancer samples, and these happen to be your normal controls, now any difference that you detect between normal and cancer is in part going to be a result of the difference between formal and fixed tissue and unfrozen tissue. And those are the kind of experimental design issues that you have to evaluate up front. And in an experiment like this, it would be perfectly reasonable to say, okay, we're going to formal and fix our tissues, at least some of our normal tissues as a control, to understand what effect that's having on our results. Uh, the last thing that was mentioned earlier is 
you're not always working with the uh, poly, with the total RNA fraction, although in many cases you are. Sometimes it will be poly A extracted, so it will only be those transcripts that have poly A tails. Um, incidentally, not all poly A tail transcripts are protein coding. There are lots of poly A tail transcripts that are not. For example, lots of processed pseudogenes, several untranslated RNAs, even some of the long link RNAs have poly A tails on them. So it's not as if that that restricts you to only protein coding genes. Um, but of course, there's other subsets that you could look at. You could, uh, one of the classic microarray papers looked at different subcellular fractions and showed that the RNA that's present <coughs> near the membrane of the cell looks substantially different than the RNA that's present in the bulk cytoplasm of the cell. And maybe most interestingly, the ones that are close to the membrane mostly included membrane-associated proteins. So the ribosomes and RNAs tend to localize closer to where they're actually going to go. So there's a lot of subsets that one can use to look at this. So I want to make sure everybody's 100% clear on how a microarray works. So imagine you've got a one-spot microarray, and there are a couple of things here. This is the glass slide. This is the spot with DNA strands arising from it. We give each of these names. The glass slide is called the chip. The DNA that is uh, extending off the chip is called the probe. And the spot that contains a number of DNA molecules, uh, identical DNA molecules, is called the feature. And curiosity, does anybody have a guess for how many DNA molecules make up a, a single feature on a, a modern array? Order of magnitude, yeah. 25. Uh, 25, 25 to 40 base pairs long, yeah. yeah 40 probes. 40 probes per spot? Okay. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? 200. Sorry? 200. 200? So I want to be clear. So the question is, in one of these features, how many identical strands of DNA are there? So 40, 200, any thousand? Yeah, so, so typically more on the order of millions. Um, we're talking about a single spot will contain 10 million. I think on the low end, it's been estimated to be 100,000. And on the high end, it would be sort of 10 to 100 million. So that kind of gives you a feel for when I draw this with three strands on it, it's got a lot more than those three strands. And uh, that means that there's a lot of possibility for experimental artifacts or for things to happen just once by chance alone because there's 100 million spots there. 100 million spots, anything can happen a couple of times. So that's the terminology we use for the array itself. We also have our DNA or cDNA or RNA that we're going to be hybridizing onto the array. And that will initially be uh, in, sitting in the cell somewhere. And we're going to label it. And it's typically labeled with a fluorescent dye. Uh, there's a couple of different fluorescent dyes. And uh, it's hybridized. So basically, just at a, a slightly elevated temperature, it's allowed to um, flow over in solution over the microarray. And the microarray itself is a little bit sticky. So a large fraction of the DNA or RNA is going to physically bind to it. Uh, and some will bind more strongly than others. The regions of strong binding are, of course, going to be the ones that are complementary to the probe sequences. At that point in time, a wash is done. And this wash has to be done really carefully. It has to be stringent enough to remove all the non-specific binding, but not so stringent as to remove the actual Watson and Crick base pair binding. So it has to be at the right amount of salt concentration, right temperature, right buffers, those kinds of things. But if it's done correctly, you're left with a slide that for each feature has only the Watson and Crick base pair binding for the exact matches. If there were none, everything should get washed off. If there was 100 million, then this should be completely saturated and every single um, target sequence will have a probe sequence bound to it. At that point in time, you can just directly scan this in any sort of a, a typical scanner and you get a picture that looks sort of like that. You can see that it's not actually a perfect spot by any means. And when you look at raw microarray data, it will always have this kind of fuzziness around it and a lot of other features that make analysis tricky. Um, but that's the core of it. You scan it, and the intensity of your fluorescent signal will be proportional to how many molecules of labeled DNA you have there. 
So if you have one, you should have half as much signal as if you have two. And since we have 100 million in some arrays, you should see a big difference between 100 million and 10 million. You should be able to distinguish those large differences. There's a couple of different microarray platforms, and I'm not going to focus primarily on different technologies, but I'll talk about it a little bit now so you're familiar with it. Uh, the classic microarray technology are what are called two-color microarrays. Uh, two-color microarrays work because you have two different animals, two different species, two different experimental conditions, and you compare them. So, for example, you can take two different organs out of a rat and uh, liver and kidney, you would label each with a different fluorescent dye, and then you'd combine those into a tube, mix them together, and hybridize them onto the array. And when you do that, now you can do what's called a competitive comparison. For each individual spot on the array, you know how many strands of red and how many strands of green. If this was liver and that was kidney, you would be able to say, I have two liver, two kidney, one liver, one kidney. Uh, two kidney, one liver. Uh, and that will allow you to compare directly on each spot. The advantage of this type of array platform is that any bias that occurs as a result of the features of a spot will be canceled out because you're comparing this to this. So for it's a, a, a simple normalization technique. So for example, if some spots were bigger than others, and you are unable to reproducibly guarantee spot size, then by doing competitive hybridization, you control for that directly. Similarly, if there were sequence-specific differences from one spot to another, or from one batch of the arrays to another, this controls for that type of an effect. And of course, I showed you here comparing liver and kidney, but you obviously can take uh, samples from different rats and mix them together and compare them. And this is not limited in any way to just rats. You can take different species. And I'm slightly joking here, but I'm not entirely. Um, one of the major uses of this technology is in comparing different species. Traditional arrays do a very good job of comparing human to primate. And almost every experiment that has successfully done comparisons of primate gene expression actually had to use competitive hybridization to account for this, the differences in sequences. And so it allows you to do a much better job of comparing species of great apes or spice variants across different types of monkeys or things like that. And although I'm still semi-joking, um, similarly, a lot of plant research started off with this kind of experiment too. Um, plant research was initially, uh, and still is, a fair bit behind the research in yeast or, or mammalian model organisms, um, and there are some very, very good libraries. And one of the features that's changing now is that for many of the other microarray technologies that we'll discuss, you need to have a sequenced genome to work with them. And for plant researchers, that wasn't necessarily the case until recently. So they would take large cDNA libraries and use them to construct their microarrays using this type of technology. By contrast, if you have a sequenced genome, there are other things that you can do. Of course, with more genome sequencing, that's not as necessary anymore. So these are spotted arrays. Um, the way they're produced is literally with a robot that has a series of needle tips. So what you're looking at here, each of these glass slides is a microarray, and this is a robotic arm that has, uh, I think it's 48 or 96 needles on this one, and it's going into a solution. So the solution chambers are over here, and it's going to dip in, grab a little bit of DNA onto the needle, and then move to the microarray and just drop it. And essentially, it's just capillary force that's going to suck the liquid from the needle onto the glass slide. The glass slide has been treated with certain chemicals. It's extremely flat, and it has the ability to um, covalently attach the DNA, the linker molecules and things like that. But the core of this is that you're going to have a robot that basically just goes producing array after an array. You can imagine some of the limitations in that are going to be the size because your, based, your, your limitation is how close you can put needles together. And that may be a uh, tenth of a millimeter, something like that. But that's still a physical limitation. So other microarray technologies that have higher density, more tightly packed spots, don't use physical procedures like this. Uh, you can almost always recognize a, a two-color microarray produced this way. One of the reasons is that they have these characteristic grouping pattern with spaces in between the, uh, the squares. Each of these corresponds to a single run from the needle head. And so essentially what would happen is there would be spot one, laid down, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so forth. So it's a sequential grinning pattern. And over the course of a print run, it's entirely possible for the needles to wear down. And so you can see a bias either uh, across one of these print grids or within um, the spatial array if the robot is not doing a good job at indirectly controlling things. So remember what I said before. To understand the technology, you have to understand, to, understand, to do the good brand for understand the technology and know the sources of error. And I just told you a whole bunch of sources of error for this technology. We won't be looking in detail at its analysis, but you have to immediately guess that there are techniques for print grid normalization groups to reduce the effect of sequential degradation of print grids. To so take a look at the fact that as this robot goes through all of these samples, the amount of DNA on its needles will start to decline. It's not going to be exactly constant, and that there's going to be some sort of a systematic batch effect. So all those factors have to be taken into account in our statistical and bioinformatic modeling. So that was sort of the classic micro, probably the oldest ones. Um, it was developed by Pat Brown and Stanford, but a number of other technologies have been developed using different types of techniques. And they all try to get around the idea that the physical spacing of the needle is a key limiting factor. Everything, all the problems that I mentioned before really come down to the needle. So could that be replaced? There's a couple of different techniques to do it. There are the inkjet-based arrays, the photolithographically uh, synthesized arrays, uh, and then there are the beta arrays, and we'll talk about each of these for a couple of minutes. So back 12 years ago, uh, HP decided that it was going to be a printer and computer company. A couple of days ago, it decided that it was no longer going to be a computer company. So I guess this is uh, appropriate to be talking about this now. And they, they spun off all its life science and measurement work into a company called Agilent. And it's actually quite striking. Um, Agilent has been a very successful company, and, and I didn't realize 10 years ago that HP had such profound life science techniques, uh, technologies. And Agilent itself uh, decided that it should start thinking about what was HP good at and how could that be used. And it started to think, well, we're good at putting really tiny dots of ink onto a piece of paper. And that's sort of the same thing as saying, I should put really tiny dots of liquid onto anything. Maybe I could put really tiny dots of DNA onto a glass slide. So could you use the same technology used for printers to generate a micro? That's the idea. And uh, indeed, you could. And so the basic idea for their arrays is that you have, instead of uh, four colors or three colors in your printer, you have four bases. And they have some specific chemistry that will allow the inkjet shooter to go ahead and say, oh, this spot needs an A. And then it will be, the micro will be flashed at a temperature with a, a little bit of uh, reagent to allow a linker molecule to be added to the top of it. And they'll say, oh, this next spot needs a C. And it will sequentially build up molecule by molecule just by shooting these out one at a time. So there's a couple of things you can imagine. One is that this isn't necessarily the fastest thing in the world if you're going to be printing really dense arrays. So there's some speed concerns. But a more practical one is uh, if you're going to be building it up base by base, at some point in time you're going to make a mistake. A molecule is not going to be added correctly. A linker is not going to be attached. The printer will make a mistake. Your software sucks. That, lots of possibilities. So there's physical limitations, not physical, there's practical limitations to how long the oligos produced with this kind of technology could be. So what kind of a range of oligos do you think would generally be produced by this? 60. 60 base pairs. Anybody think anything different? So 60, somebody say something? So 60 is what they sell, is the, the commercial. Actually, there's uh, different reasons for that. The initial paper that described this technology did some analysis and found out that there was no real scientific benefit to going up to 70, 80, or 90, which is about the max that they can do. Um, and so they do 60 because it's a lot cheaper and a lot faster for them, um, but gives about the same quality data. Uh, but it, you could probably get up to 100 with modern printers and, and piezoelectric circuits. 
So these are the, the core of all the Agilent microarrays. And you can imagine that this is produced in a way that would be more reproducible than the spotted arrays. It's limited by the density at which you can shoot things on a piece of paper, so it's much higher density. Uh, although it's still physically aimed, so there's still some uh, spatial concerns there. Uh, and it's got a much more limited range in terms of the length of the oligo. Uh, these kind of arrays, I would say, would be mostly used in a two-color fashion, although there are definite cases where people will use them with one-color uh, experiments. The second major technique developed, and I, and I really do mean second, um, the arrays that we just talked about were from 1999-2000, uh, um, but way back in 96, a year after the, two years after the first um, spotted arrays, a company out of Stanford said, well, you know, maybe we should think about this. Robotics are all nice and well, but we specialize in developing printed circuit boards, integrated circuits, transistors for computers. So can we use that technology to produce a microarray? And the basic way in which any of those technologies exist is uh, based on the um, diffraction of light through a mask, so the allowing light to touch certain parts or not touch other parts of a microarray. And so in that case, you can imagine that you're going to be limited only by the uh, wavelength of light that you're using. The tighter the wavelength and the smaller the physical mask you can make, you can focus onto very small spots. So the way in which it works is quite different from the other technologies. And we'll walk through this in a little bit more detail than the other two because we're going to be working with this data. The basic idea is that you start off with uh, a silenated glass slide. So silenated just means that it's doped in a couple of different ways chemically. That has some nice effects about uh, making it a little bit stickier, making it more chemically reactive, and also helps smooth out the surface. The surface slides has to be extremely flat. If it's not, if there's a pool in the middle, sample will pool. And as soon as you have that, you have some sort of bias because different parts of the array don't have, have similar characteristics. So the wafer will be silenated with these uh, silane molecules on top, and those are hydroxylated. So that provides sort of a sticky end onto which chemical reactions can occur. To those sticky ends, linker molecules are uh, attached, and to the best of my knowledge, we don't know what the linker molecules AFI actually uses are. I think they're not patented, the trade secret, but we could probably guess what it is. There's only a couple of chemistry types that are possible. But the idea here is that this provides something sticky and standard to which you can easily attach a nucleotide, one base at a time. And then to that, you will develop a photolithographic mask. So a photolithographic mask kind of looks like this. It's a series of spots. And you can imagine a, a big series of spots. And some places will have a hole, and other places will not. Obviously, where there's a hole, light will shine through. Where there's no hole, light will not shine through. This is identical to how um, your computers, your cell phone, chips, anything like that is produced. Um, the light shining through the mask produces the structures that later become the transistors in your computer. And so it looks exactly like that. So you've got a mask, and the mask will have a series of holes, and a lamp will be used in different wavelengths can be used here to shine the light through the mask, and it will only illuminate certain spots on the chip. And this can be controlled with very fine resolution. I want to make a point here. Do you notice that the lamp starts off as a point source, as do most lamps, but the wavelengths have to be collimated. If the wave is, wavelengths are not exactly perpendicular, uh, parallel when they go through the mass, you can have extreme problems. And this is one of the more challenging parts in the production of an integrated circuit, is ensuring accurate collimation of uh, small wavelength um, light. So now you can imagine what we've got. We've got the wafer, which has been silenated. The linker molecules have been attached. And for this kind of experiment, you're shining UV light. And the mask is present at some spots. Here it is blocking feature number two, or what will eventually be feature number two. But the UV light shines onto feature number one and feature number three. So in certain places, the light shines. In other places, it does not. All right? then you will do a deprotection. And that basically means that the UV light stimulates the linker in such a way that it can be easily lost, easily removed. 
at that point in time, we're going to pass over nucleotides. The phosphorylated nucleotides, obviously, they contain a linker molecule on one end, and the other end is reactive and can attach directly to the linker. So you've built up on the feature one and feature threes an A. Feature number two still just has the linker molecules. You wash off everything, get rid of all of your reagents, and then do this again. You change your mask, and now the mask just shines UV light onto feature number two, but feature number one and three are protected. That deactivates the linker. Uh, like, sorry, reactivates the linker. Um, and now you wash over a different nucleotide, and here you got C's built up as the first layer on feature number two. You do this sequentially. You can add features to number two and three simply by where you change your mask, and sequentially build up your array base by base. One thing that's worth pointing out, what happens if for some reason the chemical reaction is incomplete? That's definitely going to happen all the time because you've got 10 million spots, 10 million sequences on an individual spot. So instead you're going to have, these two have CG, but this one just has a C. And it's going to have an off by one error. In every case it's going to be incorrect. Well, it's actually easy for them to identify this kind of case. What happens is we deprotected the linker, so there's no linker on here. And that means that you can identify, after the base has been added, any molecule that does not have um, a reactive end to it. And instead, a capping agent can be added, and the capping agent will chain from being built any further. So you'll have some chains that get built completely, and other chains will not. And so you can build this up sequentially until you have complete chains. And here you can see that feature that we were just discussing, it's been stopped halfway, whereas the other features managed to go all the way forward. So this is sequential building up using light-activated chemistry. So what do you guys think is the range of base pairs in length that would be suitable or practical for this kind of technology? Twenty-five? Under fifty? Under fifty. Under fifty. Anybody else? Anybody think more than fifty? Yeah, so 50 would be about a practical limit. You can get um, uh, a company called Nimblegen does manage to get 50s um, or 55s on some of the array platforms, but that's about it. And Affymetrics does use 25 base pair uh, probes as a standard. And so you're seeing that there's a trade-off in the different platforms here. One of the things that you get by packing things more tightly is a reduction in the length of individual sequences. So these sequences are shorter. And shorter sequences have more potential to be matching in different places in the genome. There are fewer unique 25 base pair sequences in the genome than there are unique 100 base pair sequences. And that means we have to think much more carefully in the design of the array and in the application of the array to different questions. I mentioned different species. Well, if you've got a 100 base pair region, there's a pretty good chance that'll be different between two or three different species. But if it's a 25 base pair region, uh, that can bind in multiple places. And if we don't know the species genome, that's even worse because we've got a 25 base pair sequence and it could bind to six places in one species but only one in another. And a short enough sequence like that can be problematic. So there are big differences. The other feature that we could be talking about here is what happens if this is cancer, what happens if there's a SNP? A single SNP is not such a big problem in a 100 base pair sequence, but a single SNP in a 25 base pair sequence, ah, you got a problem. So there's a lot of other factors to consider when you're taking a look at the technology and the trade-off, not just density, but also the length of the sequences and the other characteristics. Perhaps you're going to speak about this later, but when you're talking about different platforms, mm. uh, how do the companies decide what region of the message that they have? So I'll talk only a little bit about this. Uh, different companies have different um, design criteria. And, and there's a couple of, you can imagine, pretty straightforward bioinformatics things that you would think about. One is uniqueness. Uh, so that's practical and, and critical for it. The second is, um, in many ways, will be biased towards the poly tail, um, so towards the UTIs. And there's a couple of reasons. Um, the UTI is much less uh, variable. So there's um, far more 
variability in terms of alternative start sites and alternative promoters than there is in terms of alternative tails to, put to, to transcripts. And so that allows you to be capturing a region that will encompass more transcripts than others. But when you design, uh, say, an exon array and you have sequences targeted to every exon in the chain, essentially you're just trying to maximize hybridization and uniqueness. And hybridization means balancing things like GC content and so forth. I guess I haven't said this explicitly, but um, each of these strings is going to have a different GC content. And the GC content will determine a lot about how tightly the Watson and Crick binding is. And the tighter the Watson and Crick binding, the more stringent you can be with your wash, the easier it is to remove non-specific hybridization. But you start to get a problem if your array contains huge ranges. So you have to be able to find a good balance between um, having sufficiently high GC content that you can have a a good separation, but having too much variability um, or potentially losing some genes or some interesting features. So it's a balancing act that each company does in their own specific way. All right, so let's take a look at the, the structure of, this is an older AFI array, but uh, um, like eight or ten years old now. Uh, and what you're looking at is an initial wafer, which is five inches by five inches. And from that five inch by five inch wafer, a tiny little piece will be taken for each microarray. So five inches is 12 centimeters. That's 144 centimeters squared, and that's about 1.4 centimeters. So they're getting something like 100 in. So basically, it's a 10 by 10 grid onto which these uh, masks are used to shine repeatedly the light one at a time, and they're going to make 100 identical arrays. Each one of those is placed in a nice little plastic packaging with some other things. It's about that big, but the actual array on it is about that big. So there's a, a big difference in terms of the physical packaging versus the actual experimental region. Um, each spot is 11 microns by 11 microns on the older arrays. Some of the newer ones are, I think, 9 by 9. Uh, and as I mentioned, they would contain millions of identical features. I think the newer AFI ones would be about one or two million. But there's something about the density that's determined by the length of the light. Uh, they look sort of like that. And you can sort of see there are clear patterns and biases where there's lines here that look consistent. There are a couple of reasons for that. Some are experimental artifacts that we'll talk about, and others are placed intentionally on the array by the manufacturer so that it will make it easier for the software to distinguish one 11 micron spot, uh, 100 micron squared spot from another 100 micron squared spot. So it allows you to do a better job of distinguishing spot from spot. So we call that the chip, we call that the feature. And let's talk a little bit about what the overall experimental procedure is if I don't trip and kill myself. Um, all right, so the overall experimental procedure for an AFI array starts off with total RNA, not poly-A, total, which is reverse transcribed into cDNA. It's in vitro um, transcribed then into a biotin-labeled cRNA. Biotin gives some sort of a uh, capturable thing, something that allows to do strong tags to it um, to fix things. Um, so it depends. Um, at this stage, there's actually a couple of different kits that can be used for it. There's one that's specific for a new gene, which is random primed. There's some that are oligo DT primed. And so it depends what you're looking for on the array. Um, some AFI arrays only contain poly A transcripts, others don't. So in some cases, it wouldn't matter. Um, these fragments, these, these RNAs are then fragmented. And remember that I said that the micro itself will contain 25 base pair fragments. Well, that means that it's going to be a bit weird if you have a 1,000 base pair RNA and you're trying to hang it onto a 25 base pair hinge. So you need to have them fragmented into smaller chunks that you can attach. Um, these are then directly hybridized onto the micro uh, washed, and washing to remove the nonspecific. And then the biotin can be stained using different uh, fluorophores, and those can be scanned for analysis. So here you don't have the fluorescent label coming in at an early step like you do in the other ways we talk about. Instead, you just have the biotin labeling, 
and it's only at the last step that you introduce the fluorescence after things have been down to the array. And this may or may not improve the, the signals and noise qualities of the platform. I say may or may not. The problem with saying that is we only know what the signal qualities are. We don't actually do experiments where we compare five or six different techniques of this. Presumably the companies have done that and we, we trust that they got it right. Um, but we wouldn't be able to do that. And we could only say AFI has this signal to noise characteristic, Agilent has these. And we don't really know what exact feature of the platform leads to that. Uh, and so of course, when you look at it in the end, you're going to have a series of uh, probe DNA to which a target DNA will be bind with the biotin conjugation. And then you can uh, label those and directly visualize. Okay, so this is that image that I showed you before, uh, and I want to be a little bit, a little bit more detailed about this. So you can see along the edge there are these little dots. Can people see those over here? Yeah. So those are what are called landing lights. They allow you to accurately software grid and align the the array itself. You can also see up here. It says gene chip. Uh, HGU133A. That's not something that we add digitally. They actually make some of the control probes make out the label for the type of the array. So that we, if you really don't know what version of an array you are working with, you can look on that and find out exactly what it is. Now, if you don't know what version of an array you're working with, you have other problems that we should talk about. But um, yeah, uh, there's also a couple of other things that are worth noting. So this right here, Bright spot, experimental artifact. That's not a, a reasonable um, control or anything like that. Uh, similarly, you can see some dead spots. So in this region over here, it's very light intensity, and you can see bands. And the bands are generally scanner artifacts. They're generally things that are not physically part of the array manufacturer, though they could be. Um, and they are, again, experimental artifacts that need to be removed in analysis. We'll talk about how to do that in a second. Uh, the other thing that's really important is to emphasize that it's a set of 25 base pair probes. And Affymetrics is, is clever enough to say, well, you know, I don't think one 25 base pair probe can completely represent a gene in all its spice variants. So instead, it says we'll represent a single uh, gene by multiple 25 base pair probes. Um, anybody have a feel for how many they typically use to represent one gene? Three to four. Three to four? Ten? Ten? Anybody say more? So it depends entirely on the array. Depends on the version of the array. The old arrays use 20. The new arrays use three to four. So the exon arrays use three to four. Um, and the, there's a couple of reasons why. One is if you use 20, then you get one fifth as many genes in your array as if you use four. So if you want to represent every exon, you need 10 times as much. And therefore, it makes sense to reduce the number. But there's immediately some quality trade-off there. The fact that you've got that redundancy is really important, though, because uh, these 25 base pair technologies are really prone to SNPs. So a SNP can mess up one 25 base pair probe. And therefore, you're going to need uh, something that will allow you to control for that. And so having multiple and seeing, oh, here's an outlier, allows you to systematically control that. But the other thing that's advantageous about this, and not just advantageous, but critical to successfully analyze this type of data, is the fact that the mappings between 25 base pair probes and genes can be changed. The array that's most commonly used is something called the U133 array. So that corresponds to Unigene version 133. Uh, Unigene is at version 200 or something like that now. So it's using a really old definition of the genome, our transcriptome, and a really unclear mapping of specific sequences. So as a result, you're going to take a look at it and say, well, many of the genes that we thought existed then don't exist anymore. Some genes that we thought were unique, the sequence uniquely represented this gene, we find out it no longer does so. Uh, two independent genes, instead they were actually just a single gene and we were looking at different variants of it. That's a problem, because if you try to use gene definitions that are 12 years old, 11 years old, um, you're not going to get very good results. 
So instead, one of the things that is almost critical to the analysis of any AFI experiment is to update the gene mappings. Those are in what's called the CDF file, the chip definition file. And the CDF file will allow you to customize the mapping however you like. There is substantial computational uh, involvement in doing that. There's substantial computational involvement in doing that. Um, so the typical way of doing that would be to take the million odd sequences and map each of them to the transcriptome and piece together the mapping to come up with appropriate criterion to remove any mismatches or any sequences that be represented in the transcriptome, to remove hypervariable regions that are highly prone to SNPs, and then to repeat this for every single AFI array. Surprisingly, AFI doesn't do that. Um, although you, you kind of expect the AI manufacturer to do so. Um, but happily, several academic groups, and this afternoon we'll have, see the application of it to your, your actual data set that you'll be working with. Okay? So that's Affymetrics. Um, another technology is the Illumina self assembling beta arrays. It's pretty different from anything that we've talked about. The idea here is that there's individual beads, glass beads, to which there's going to be on the order of hundreds of thousands of probes, small probes. Notice that hundreds of thousands is actually quite a bit smaller than the millions that we were talking about before. So these glass beads are going to have 25 base pair probes attached to them, and they're going to have some sort of an address, some sort of a, a label that can tell you what each sequence on them is. And you're going to have an ordered array where you just put a random set of beads doesn't really matter, it would be, um, I think it would be on the order of a million beads. Uh, and, no, 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 yeah, about a million beads. And each individual sequence will be represented tens or hundreds of times by replicate beads. So in essence, you're going to be measuring this 25 base pair sequence. You're going to aggregate 100,000 signals for each bead to get a measurement, but then you're going to have a lot of beads say 100 times, so you'll replicate that many times. And that will allow you to have assessments of the variability caused by the array manufacturer, the bead orientation, and those kinds of things. Immediately from what I just described, can anybody see the experimental design issues that we're going to have to deal with when analyzing this kind of data? What would be some of the things that we really start thinking about? Yeah, so you've got the address mapping, which could have errors. Yeah, good. What else? Other technological things here that are going to cause noise in an experiment. Michelle. Closeness of beads. Yeah. So they try to order the beads in a, a systematic way, but if there's any errors in ordering, then you have a big problem. And a couple of other things that are really systematic artifacts here. Um, one of them is that, as I mentioned, it's a 25 base pair probe. And instead of replicating different parts of the gene many times, you're replicating that same part many times. So you're not getting a good assessment of biological variability. You're getting an excellent assessment of technical variability. And there's a problem there. This kind of technology would be very prone to SNPs, as an example. It doesn't have the redundancy in terms of sequence differences that the other technologies that we described do. Um, if you do that, you reduce the amount of technical replication, and so they don't. On the arrays that we've seen, they typically have 70,000 unique sequences, and those 70,000 sequences for 20,000 genes in the genome mean two to three per uh, gene, most of which will be spice variants. Yeah. Studies yeah, so I wasn't going to talk at all about concordant studies. Um, so basically, there have been a couple of big studies on this. Um, the most important is called the Micro Quality Control Consortium, or MAQC. The MAQC, to the best of my memory, did not include an Illumina array in their comparison. It's from 2006. Um, but they did do AFI, Agilent, uh, spotted CDNAs, and a couple of other platforms. The experiment itself was done by, I think it was by NIEHS, so the Institute of Environmental and Health Studies in the US. Um, and it's a controversial study. 
for a couple of reasons. One, the bioinformatics of it and the way it was analyzed was very controversial. Two, some people have suggested that they knew the conclusion that they were going to reach before the experiments were done. And the conclusion was that the array platforms are very highly reproducible. Uh, they compared them to, for example, real-time PCR of 1,000 genes. They did mixture experiments where they had 100% of one thing, 90%, 80, 70, 60, 50, through to 100% of something else. And they looked at the dilution curves and those sorts of things. And so the, the stated conclusions is highly reproducible in the order of 98 or 99%. And a subsequent follow-up suggested that modern arrays are better than that. I, I do agree with the criticism, and this is now personal opinion, I agree with the criticism that, um, that these studies have been slightly oversold, but I think they provide a pretty core of truth. They, for the majority of genes, you'll have pretty good uh, reproducibility. Uh, that being said, it depends a lot on the nature of your samples. So if I were to see uh, a much more unusual sample type, like rare FFP cancer samples, which have lots of mutations and degraded RNA, you see a much bigger difference than you do using cell culture work, like what they did, or, or fresh frozen tissue. So it's not exactly straightforward. and. Uh, None of the manufacturers is going to do and publish a truly unbiased study of this. So it's a little tricky to, to address that. Okay. The other thing, of course, that, that causes a problem here is if you have 100 technical replicates of something, how do you collapse them? You take the mean, the median, do you throw out outliers? How do you do outlier removal? There are immense informatic and biostatistical questions involved in how you handle that data. At least with an athlete, all you've got is you've got you know, one signal for each sequence, and you've got 11 signals per gene, and you, you merge them together. Here you've got a variable number for each technical replicate, and you have to determine how to aggregate those. So there's a number of different features here that make life more complicated. And not necessarily worse, just more or less complicated. Um, comparing platforms is tricky, and this is a very subjective ranking, and it's not actually a ranking, and I'm certainly not going to stand here and endorse one platform over the other. I don't think that's fair. But I think what's, what's pretty clear is that they're big and well-described differences in price. So the spotted arrays are by far the cheapest, although they're not really being manufactured very much anymore. Um, after arrays are probably the most expensive, uh, and the expense is not necessarily manufacturing, it's also related to their market pricing ability. Uh, and inkjet and beta arrays are sort of in the middle. The length of the sequences uh, ranges from the very highly variable for the spotted arrays, the 25 base pairs for AFI and bead and 70 for inkjet. Um, and this is a, a personal idea of what I think of the data quality of it. And I think nobody, few would disagree that the spotted arrays have the most artifacts and challenges to remove. And for a number of reasons, primarily related to the systematic manufacturing processes, uh, many, although not all, will agree that AFI has uh, highest data quality with inkjet and beta arrays being somewhere in the middle. But I mean, what exactly do you mean by data quality? It depends on your experiment, so that's a, a key point to consider. Um, but lastly, the bioinformatics research is something else that's really important. You do not want to get a microarray platform and spend six months working at, okay, how do I normalize my microarray because nobody has ever normalized this type of array data before. That is not a fun situation. So instead, you want to be able to rely on a community of experts who will help you working through the analysis. And that involves everything from the low-level image that comes off of these microarray machines, parsing it into R. That's a pain. I had to do that by hand once for a microarray platform, and it took two and a half months of coding and thinking and going through it. That, to me as a bioinformatician, is not a waste of time, but not what I would like to be doing. I'd like to be thinking about what's the biological relevance of it, how does it work. So there's clearly the most research into spotted cDNA arrays. Um, they're the oldest platform. They have a number of features that really interested biostatisticians when they first came out, and uh, billions of methodological papers on it. Affymetrics arrays also have tons and tons of methodological work, and that's one of the reasons talking about them, um, working through them in the, the practical session. Uh, in general, have a smaller amount, but in many cases they can use the techniques that were used for spotted cDNA arrays. And in part because they're more recent, the beta arrays have the least amount of uh, algorithmic development that's been done. Yeah? Um, 
Well, the CDF or um, yeah. the files that are unique and they will change according to what you know about the uh, general That was for Apple Metrics, but is there the same thing for all the other platforms or something similar to it? So uh, for Alpha Metrics, it's well system systematized. Um, so it's well described how that's done and, and where they're available. There was a group in Cambridge or Oxford, but one or the other, that was looking at doing the same for read arrays and remapping them. And I'm not sure if they still do so or if they, they didn't have the resources to continue doing so. Um, Agilent does it themselves, and so it's more company available. And I'm not aware of a systematic, universal um, resource for spotted arrays. And in part, that's because spotted arrays are much more variable from who manufactures it, where it's done. And so some places, core facilities that make them may actually do that. Uh, others probably do not. I know that in my lab, when we dealt with spotted array, we actually had a system that we would run every would remap every probe because it was just not worth the effort of looking for all the individual remappings. So it's kind of variable on that. I would say AFI is the only place where it's without, but for AFI, it's the most critical that it be there. With an ink generator, it's as important on a 70 base pair sequence as it is on a 25. All right. And so the next thing that you might ask about is what are these microarrays actually? used for. And I'm not going to dwell on this in a, a lengthy period of time, but I want to highlight some things that you may not have thought of. So the first thing I'll point out is that from a molecular level, these things do a lot more than you might initially think. So if you're hybridizing DNA to your microarray, the first thing that you can do is you can take a look at DNA sequence. If you know there's a SNP, you can design two sequences, one of which recognizes allele A, the other one of which recognizes allele B. You can look at the ratio of those two sequences, and you can determine is this a AA, AB, or BB. So you can directly detect uh, genetic variation using a micro. Similarly, if you space your probes across the entire genome, you can look at trends in signal intensity across the genome and therefore identify copy number variation. And I think uh, Saurabh Shah is going to talk about that uh, technology in some detail tomorrow. Michelle? Saurabh tomorrow? Thursday. Thursday, so in a couple of days. Um, you can also use this as a technique to actually extract specific regions of DNA. And so John talked to you yesterday about uh, sequencing, and one of the interesting things in sequencing is to say, can we focus on a specific region of the genome? Maybe you really just want to sequence chromosome 2. Well, you could have a microarray that represents all of the sequences on chromosome 2. You hybridize your DNA from a, a patient sample to that microarray. You wash off all the non-specific. What's left is just the chromosome 2 DNA. Now you reverse the uh, hybridization, put a very, very harsh salt wash. What you've got left is just the chromosome 2 DNA. So it can be a purification technique. You can do that to extract only the exonic regions of the genome. You can extract anything that you like in that technique. Similarly, I mentioned uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation. You can work on subsets of DNA extracted by antibody-based techniques or, or cellular fractionation or, or any other kind of technique. And then the last thing worth pointing out for DNA arrays is tag quantitation. So imagine somebody does genetic screening. And a uh, sample experiment would be they have an um, uh, overexpression library where they're going to put into each cell a construct that represents uh, every gene in the, the genome, and that they're going to randomly uh, transfect cells with these, and they're going to look at some sort of phenotypes. Perhaps they look at growth rate, and they'd like to see which cells grow faster and which ones grow shorter. Well, if you have a tag that's present in those, you can quantitate those tags directly and determine the relative abundances of those to uh, accelerate how quickly you can do genetic screening. And so that's another classic technique that would be um, doable by microarrays, but more easily doable by, uh, um, doable by sequencing, but more cheaply doable by microarrays, at least today. Um, at the RNA level, there's a number of other things that you can do. So we talked at the beginning about the limitations of an RNA array. Well, there's also a lot of possibilities. So 
obviously what we normally get is mRNA abundances, but there's been a lot of research on how you can take a look at piecing together different transcript isoforms. So how you can take a look at different splice variants and determine what is the overall structure of the gene. In particular, there's um, several ways that include not just probes to individual exons, but include junction probes, where half of the probe an exon 1 and half of the probe is an exon 2. And if a transcript doesn't exist that pieces exon 1 and exon 2 together, that probe won't light up. And so you can piece those together to have a, an exact picture of what the transcript looks like. There's studies on mRNA localization, mRNA degradation or half-life using metabolic labeling techniques, and mRNA translation rates using sucrose density gradients for um, uh, polysome capture. All those RNA techniques are pretty readily accessible. These are things that have been published pretty widely and are, are easily enough used. They're not necessarily easily used on patient samples. Several of them require you to be able to manipulate the cells in a growing way. And that's why techniques that allow you to manipulate patient samples, like xenografts or primary cell lines, are increasingly becoming important in cancer genomics. And lastly, and we're not going to talk about this at all, but um, I said at the beginning, a microarray is an ordered array of stuff. It doesn't have to be DNA. It could be proteins, it could be cells, it could be lipids, it could be just about anything. And there are techniques present in the literature and there are people doing analysis using all of those different things. You can imagine there are challenges with each of them and the bioinformatics with each of them is a, a different question. But a microarray does not have to be RNA and DNA limited, although that's the application we see the most. From a biological point of view, and let's focus here on RNA, there's a couple of things that you, you'd want to think about. First, a microarray, as I said at the beginning, is most often used as a hypothesis generating tool. It says, we've done an experiment, what genes are important in this biological situation? I'd like to learn what they are so I can figure out why they're important and how they work. So that candidate gene identification is easily the most common thing that we do with microarray data. However, the next common thing is to say, all right, we've got candidate genes, how do they fit into biological pathways? What are those pathways? What do they represent? Is there a series of changes that are not the largest changes in the cell, but that together are able to account for a much more coherent variability? Every glucose metabolizing gene is down twofold. It's not as exciting as having one gene that's down a thousandfold, but that consistency will allow you to get a bigger picture understanding of what's going on. On the other hand, you might be thinking about classifiers and predictive models. So if you do a micro experiment uh, on clinical patient samples, the most common question asked is, can we predict the difference between subgroups of disease? Subgroups that differ in their outcome, differ in their clinical presentation, differ in their response to therapy. And those biomarker-based methods require all sorts of statistics and bioinformatics from the fields of machine learning. Many people work on drug dose response and time course studies. Uh, and of course, there's the integration of this type of data with many other types of data. So there's a lot of different things that you do with the microarray data. And they all start with you actually having the data in hand and being able to extract core meaning from it, normalize it, reduce biological variability and technical noise, and focus on interesting trends. Some of the downstream analyses are going to be talked about extensively over the next couple of days. So as an example, um, there's detailed work on pathways, detailed work on clinical integration. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about uh, copy number variation. So you're going to hear about each of these things in a little more depth. So I'm not going to cover those. I'm going to tell you how you get the data to the point that you can generate what you need to be able to do pathways, to be able to do integration with clinical data sets, and to be able to look at how it relates to copy number variability. And so that leads us to the core question, which is, how is microarray data analyzed? And this comes down to the core workflow or the core pipeline that we use. And the short answer to how it's generated, to how it's analyzed, is you're going to have a series of algorithms, one at a time, each of which is intended to remove one source of noise from your microarray study. And we're going to talk about these, how they fit together, and what they're intended to do. So you start off with your microarray. Let's pretend for the sake of example that it's a two-color microarray. There are differences for each platform and how this goes, but not very substantive ones. So you start off with a microarray. The very first thing that you have is a nice pretty picture. 
of uh, 100,000 or a million spots, each of which is shining red or green or, or some other color, and you need to be able to do something with it. And that means the first thing that you need to do is to take each of these probes and quantitate it. You need to be able to attach a number to that. And the first set of algorithms takes your image and converts it into numbers, takes analog and converts it into digital. And that is absolutely critical and a very ignored step. As an example, um, people who work with micro data often can't tell you how they got this step done because it's sometimes done by manufacturer pipelines or manufacturer software that people haven't considered. What is the source of noise? How does this work? Is there variability? Should I have tweaked parameters? At that stage, you're going to start looking at the individual spots. And when you look at an individual spot, very frequently you'll find that the spot at the center is very clearly defined, but outside of it is a sort of halo. There's some sort of a, a background effect, and this could be non-specific hybridization, it could be um, uh, incomplete washing, it could be a lot of different things, but that background needs to be removed to ensure that what you're dealing with is pure signal. At that point, you'll typically want to identify low-quality spots, regions of the array that you don't trust for whatever reason, and exclude them from your analysis. If you have um, a two-color array, or even on many one-color arrays, you're going to want to remove trends that are specific to individual microarrays. That would mean, for example, if you have a two-color array, red and green, you can imagine pipetting red, pipetting Psi 3 and Psi 5 into a tube. Uh, you're not necessarily going to get exact quantities. You may be off by a tenth of a microliter or a hundredth of a microliter. That needs to be accounted for. You need to be able to balance the signal intensity so the channels look the same. There are assumptions implicit in that approach, but we'll talk about them later. But those kind of variability on a specific array by array basis need to be removed. After that, your typical experiment will have many arrays, and you need to bring all those arrays to a common basis. And those arrays can differ because of batch effects or differences in the quantitation or uh, label efficiency or, or sample differences in how good your RNA extraction was between that. And to do any sort of fair statistical analysis, you have to bring all of your arrays to a common distribution. At that point, once you have your arrays on a common distribution, to do statistical analysis of it. We have to identify, are there any trends of interest here at all? Does this drug cause an effect? Are the genes correlated with patient outcome? Whatever the statistical question is, you need to have appropriate techniques to measure it. Then we get into downstream analysis. One of the first things that we do in most experiments is to cluster the data. We'll talk a little bit about why, what that teaches you, and what it shouldn't be used for. And then lastly, integration. And we'll leave that as a black box for today, and we're going to talk about integration over the rest of the week. So what I've just described, you can sort of break into two different sets. There's the first set of uh, uh, steps, algorithms, that are used to remove noise. They're intended to clar clarify or purify your data set to make it as clean as possible. We generally call the removal of noise pre-processing. And then you want to extract information from your data. We want to find biologically relevant conclusions, and this is the statistical or downstream analysis. So we're going to talk about each of those steps a little bit, and if I'm on track for time, it's about 10.20. So we'll go through a couple of steps now, then we'll and then we'll come back and uh, finish off the rest of the steps before you start on uh, that tour. How many breaks is at 11? At 11? Oh, no, no, that actually works well. We should get almost to, to the end. Thank you. All right. So we'll talk about each of the steps uh, in a little bit of detail. And the first step, as I mentioned, and critical one, is the quantitation of the data. So the way this is done is with a series of algorithms called image segmentation algorithms. Uh, it's actually one of the more difficult things that we work at in, in microarray analysis. Uh, it's one of the hardest problems in bioinformatics, actually. Uh, and in an interesting Side note, it's also one of the least studied. There's not a lot of work going on on image segmentation algorithms for, for this type of problem. So the core idea, when you're looking at a two-color array, just because it's easier to visualize, but the challenges are really unchanged for any way. <laughs> the core idea is that if you look at this, you can sort of see that there's a pattern there. You can imagine, well, I see these 
empty columns over here, and I think I see sort of rows like this. But you have to be able to identify them. And the algorithm is going to say, all right, let's first start off by recognizing local subregions. Within those local subregions, I can then identify specific spots, and then for each specific spot, delineate exactly where the spot is. So it's sequential. And so it's not that hard to look at it and to be able to draw those grids around it. Uh, but for a computer, it's actually a pretty challenging thing. And the way the computer goes ahead and does it is by saying it's going to integrate signal across both dimensions of the array. And so there are, there are many tweaks and differences in the algorithms used, but really they all come down to this. Here you've got a mini array with four subgrids, and all it's going to do is for every line of pixels, it's going to add up the intensities across one, two, ch 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 every single row and every single column. And when it does that, you're going to see a pattern that's going to emerge like this. You're going to have peaks where you have um, spots. And you're going to be able to say, oh, here's a spot, here's a spot corresponding to different peaks. And that will allow you to identify the gaps as well as to identify the spots within the grids. Now, there's several challenges here. One is that you would hope that the properly geometric range, but it may not be. So where you're going to be saying, all right, here's the intersection of this and that, it won't actually necessarily be there. So what you have to do is initially grid the spots, they go into an initial location, and then the software is smart enough to tweak it and modify it to bring it into the correct location. So it's got an iterative adjustment procedure to, to account for that. But then when you get to having a single grid, you might repeat the procedure, but it still gets pretty challenging. Uh, there's a number of things when you look at this, what appears to be directly gridded um, array, that will make your life semi-miserable if you're a computer program. The first is, what is that? Is that a spot, or is that an artifact? There's no information to tell you about this. You can't tell if there should be something there or not. And there's nothing that the computer program ha will have looking at this image that will help it distinguish those two cases. Similarly, there's a couple of blank rows in here. You can imagine, maybe these are both real blank rows. That, to me, looks clearly like a red spot. But of course, it's background fluorescence. Maybe the entire array here is going to be shifted off one in either direction. And so that misgridding or misalignment would throw off the entire array experiment. So there's a number of different things that have to be accounted for, and the software has to be smart enough to know when it can't accurately make a call. When it says, you know what, I'm not sure what I'm looking at, so I'm just going to flag this. I'm going to say there's something wrong here. And the software packages not only have to handle cases like this, but know when a case came up that they can't make an accurate decision on. Surprisingly enough, there's not a whole lot of research into this, and maybe it's not surprising. Um, it's probably a source of error in all studies, and nobody really knows how to... Uh, you can manually take a look at all the different kinds of features that you get on a, on a way and try to program those in, but that requires a large amount of work, and as arrays get to be very high density, how do you look at it? Who has the energy and time to systematically look across a million spots on uh, 50 arrays to get sufficient replication, identify what are the systematic kind of trends and artifacts, and then write a computer program to do it, uh, to account for it. Uh, part of it is the people who would have the capacity to write the computer programs may not be the people who have the patience to look at um, 50 million spots by hand, and even the people who have the skills to develop the algorithm to, write, to, to solve this problem may not be the people who can implement it in a computer program that will run fast enough to be, to be useful. So this is almost certainly a source of error in all stuff. Um, manual detection of uh, manual checking of spots remains the only normal way of doing this, and my lab did this up until three or four years ago, and we no longer do. It's just impractical with the size of arrays and the experiments that we deal with. Uh, and I guess the last point I don't. Have to, um, anybody have a guess as to how often it happens that there's a gridding problem? It's a couple of estimates in the literature. So, what fraction of spots on array appear to have a gridding problem? So who thinks it's more than 50%? More than 
more than 5%? It should be everybody who said more than 10%, by the way. Uh, anybody think it's less than 1%? Yeah, so uh, estimates for CDNA arrays were 5 to 10%, and for oligo arrays are about 1%. So that's not totally horrible, but 1% is 1% on an experiment that you're paying a lot of money and generating millions of data points. So uh, it's a significant source of error. Are you talking about spotted arrays? Nope, this is true for even um, oligo uh, piezoelectric printed arrays or for. Uh, So the next thing that you do and you convert it to numbers is to say, I'm going to have to remove background signal. And we should talk about what exactly I mean by background signal, but it's talking about stray fluorescence, something that's not biologically of interest. Uh, we typically do it using model-based techniques, and uh, I'll say that this is probably the other extremely difficult problem in, in well, two or three extremely difficult problems in microarray analysis, um, maybe even harder than the, the spot problem that we talked about. Uh, and the typical way it's done is with model-based approaches, and there is a, a bit of research. So what we're actually dealing with is a spot on an array that is going to look something like this. There's going to be a core spot that's very, very clearly hybridized. I'm drawing these as circles. It doesn't matter if your technology produces squares or circles or beads. Um, they'll all have this feature. So each of those circles is going to have its own clear signal. It will be surrounded by a sort of nimbus, an aura of less intense signal that is just due to this part being saturated and this one not. And then by some sort of a halo of background that is either non-specific hybridization or the fluorescence of the glass light itself or something like that. So it's not really clear what any of these things are except for the middle one. The middle one is clearly signal, but the other three two, uh, we don't exactly know what they are. And so what should the true signal intensity be? Should it just be this? Or should it be related to what we see in the back? And especially since these two can vary systematically from spot to spot. So, the typical way in which we, we look at it, and this is part of what a segmentation software has to do, it is say this is the foreground, you will usually ignore that intermediate nimbus and, and say this is the background, and then you might immediately think that it's pretty straightforward. The signal intensity of the spot is just the foreground minus the background. And it would be nice if it were that simple. Unfortunately, it's not. And there's a lot of reasons why. Uh, the first is that this means that when the background is larger than the foreground, you get negative signal intensity. No such thing as negative mRNA abundances. You shouldn't be having negative fluorescence. So something physically is going wrong in your experiment. And it might still be OK to just ignore those spots if it didn't happen too often. But in a typical experiment, it can happen 1 or 2% of the time. So a simple background subtraction doesn't work, just from a pure physical perspective. Uh, not only that, but the spots that have these particular features are actually biased towards being particularly uh, interesting spots. For example, there are spots that are low-intensity genes, genes that are turned on, that we can prove using other technologies are on, but that have low intensity. It's also correlated to certain uh, sequence characteristics. So low, uh, low GC content, high AT content sequences are more prone to have background than high GC content sequences. So a couple of papers back in 2001 showed that in many cases, an empty spot, a completely empty spot, would have um, less signal than the actual background of the array. So that if you had just the DNA there, and not the glass slide, not the, the intrinsic fluorescence of the glass slide, you would actually have a, an inversion of this situation. And so these spots, in many cases, turned out to be um, genes that were uh, entirely off, negative controls and things like that. And so unbound spots are particularly problems, and that led to a lot of people thinking that maybe you should just threshold your background. And there are a number of techniques in the literature that just say, we well, ignore the fact that we're going to be losing low expression and high A spots, and anything that has this characteristic will set it to a signal of one or two. And that's one the fair, although not exactly a, a careful, technique for handling background. Uh, 
Um, the other people are focused on what I would generously call heavy duty mathematical techniques. Um, there's three, they come from different places. So the Edwards model is from Stanford, um, Smythe is from uh, Australia, and the Cooperberg is from Boston. And essentially, each of them around the same time use very sophisticated mathematical techniques to attempt to remove background noise. And I would be uh, point out to you that we'll give you um, a bibliography that will stick up on the uh, wiki so you can see papers that, that reference these techniques. Um, but the math here is very advanced and will probably take several hours to go over. So let's just leave aside the mathematical details of it and talk a little bit about what are the distinction between the techniques. Look at the names that are used here. The Edwards model is called a logolinear technique. It assumes that the noise is logarithmic distributed, logarithmically distributed, and the signal is linearly distributed. And it seems that within an individual spot. If that assumption is incorrect, the model won't work. By contrast, the Smythe model uses a normex, a normal exponential convolution. It's assuming that the uh, background noise is normally distributed and the signal is exponentially distributed. There's a big difference between log linear and normal exponential. And so you can see immediately that they're making an assumption about the nature of the noise. And if that assumption is correct or incorrect, it'll change what happens. By contrast, the Cooperberg model is Bayesian. A Bayesian model does not make the same kind of assumptions, but it attempts to learn what they are and kind of empirically understand what the data looks like. So with that in mind, you might not be surprised that there are big, big differences in how fast they work. Um, so when I say that the Cooperberg model is very slow, we did an experiment of 72 arrays and uh, processed them in with just the Cooperberg background correction took two days on uh, five nodes, five CPUs. So about 10 CPU days to do that background correction. I'm not talking about quantitation, normalization, statistical analysis, anything like that, just to do that aspect. It's hard to say for sure with any of these questions, what is the best or the worst background correction, but the feeling in the literature is that the Cooperberg actually is probably the best. It does a good job of being flexible to unusual background noise characteristics, and it does a good job of uh, handling even cases which have very, very little noise. Um, but in any case, any of these methods are certainly superior to the foreground minus background, or the foreground minus background and pretend that everything negative is zero. Um, they've been shown in validation studies versus QPCR to be much more accurate techniques. So it's important to think about your background correction technique according to how much time you have to wait for your analysis to run your computational characteristics and what you think the background noise characteristics of your data set are. All right, so background correction is challenging. And maybe the last super challenging question that, that we'll come across is uh, spot quality. And so I mentioned that you're going to want to know which are those spots on your array that are reliable and which are those that are unreliable. And all the spots you'd want to include in your analysis and the unreliable ones you'd want to exclude. And those are there for manufacturing defects, could be artifacts in your hybridization, you could have scratched a portion of your array, a lot of things could have happened. And uh, the best way of doing this I would classify as unknown. The general way, let's talk conceptually, the general way we really like to do this is to say that a perfect spot, we should give it a rate of 1. And a really useless spot, we should give it a rate of 0. And there would be spots that are somewhere in between that we'd have a different amount of evidence for. Spots that we'd say, this spot, uh, it's okay, but there's a little bit of noise there, it's a 75% spot. Other spots that you go, well, it contains a little bit of information, and if we have lots of corroboration and, and support from other arrays, I would consider it, but by itself it doesn't give me a lot of evidence, so it's a 10% spot. So you'd want to be able to rank each feature in that sort of a way. So then the real question gets, how do we calculate those weights? How do we know what is really good and reliable and what is really useless and unreliable and you know, maybe what fits in between. And so there's a couple of approaches that are, are well described in the literature. By far the most useful
approach is what's called the mean median correlation. So imagine that you've got a spot, and the spot contains 100 pixels. You can calculate the mean intensity of those 100 pixels, and you can calculate the median intensity of those 100 pixels. If the spot has any sort of a, a symmetrical distribution, the mean and the median ought to be the same. If the mean is not similar to the median, if the ratio between the mean and the median is skewed, that immediately tells you that there's something unusual about the spot distribution of the pixels within an individual feature. Remember a feature contains, say, a million probes, and if there's 100 pixels co covering those million probes, then each one of those pixels is capturing about 10,000. So there's a lot of signal integration going on there, but not so much that you can't be able to distinguish that. So that's one uh, clear technique that's been used. The other one that's been used are what are called composite Q metrics. Q stands for quality. Composite quality metrics sort of means that you arbitrarily come up with a number of different measures of quality. They can be really arbitrary. Uh, and you multiply them together, composite. And that gives you a composite Q score. And people have demonstrated pretty clearly that sometimes if you hybridize the same sample against the same sample, so compare the same sample to itself, taking into account spot quality will allow you to reduce the noise or variability. The problem is how do you define those Q metrics? You, you need to come up with some sort of a characteristic. And people have used things like signal intensity or the circularity spot or the number of pixels, um, the standard deviation with the pixels within the spot. Uh, the problem is both of these will sometimes fail randomly, and what I mean fail, they are things that you the spots that are visually clearly incorrect to be perfect quality, and they will say to a spot that is very clearly unreliable, that they are, sorry, they would say to a spot that is clearly reliable that is unreliable. And that's because the distributions that you're trying to estimate off of only 100 pixels or in some new arrays even fewer, are, you just can't make that kind of statistical inference from it. So it becomes really challenging. Nobody really needs to solve this. So you might say, Paul, do I, do I really need this? You're telling me it's a hard problem, so why do you need it? And the short answer is you need it because if you look at it in a way, you can immediately see what's going on all over the place. So here's an example of a, a these are uh, Agilent piezoelectric arrays, I think. Um, and you've got a single bright spot that's got lovely signal characteristics. And you can see that its signal is bleeding over into the spots next to it. So that this strong central spot is increasing the background and reducing the quality of the spots around it. Here is a spot that looks perfectly fine except for this black X in the middle of it, a black plus sign. Now, if we go ahead and do quality assessments, this saturated spot is going to come up perfect, and this other spot that, to my eye, looks just as good is going to come up as a problem because it's got that interior um, heterogeneity. That's, that's not really a bad spot, but this is a much worse one. Where exactly is the spot, and what exactly are we dealing with? And if you ask me, there's no way any, any gridding alignment is going to be smart enough to figure out what the underlying signal intensity here and here is. Uh, the correct answer is to drop both of those spots from the analysis. Uh, it gets worse. So not only does this one have an artifact, this one has an artifact. You can see that the artifact is causing a halo effect that's affecting the background of one, two, three spots. So not only is one spot the other three should probably have reduced quality because the signal is going to be affected. Uh, this is probably an array manufacturer issue. It looks like in the printing some sort of bleed occurred from one spot to the next, and I'm not sure that we could reliably trust the signal intensity of even this spot. Is it likely that the segmentation software accurately distinguished this from this? I think not. And all of those are from a single array that I would have called good quality, but certainly we used the array in a published experiment. So those are the kind of feature qualities that you will see over and over in a microarray. And somebody's going to say, uh, I used this array or this other commercial supplier or Affymetrics, it won't have those quality issues. So let's quickly look at some Affymetrics data. So the first set of Affymetrics data I'll show you is just looking at the overall array signal intensities. 
and I colored this in green and yellow to make it a little clear what, uh, what you're looking at, but uh, you can look at this in black and white. All right, so over here in this corner, we've got an unstraight glass slide. The hybridization pooled, and there's much more signal intensity in this corner than in any other part of the array. We've got some sort of an interesting spatial pattern over here. Uh, these kind of spatial patterns often correspond to incomplete um, poor temperature gradients in your hybridization ovens. I would have called that a thumbprint kind of feature. And you can see here is the Affymetrics label, one of the two Affymetrics label IDs, and it certainly does not look uh, at the same background, oops, background signal intensities as everything else. And all of these arrays were from a spiking experiment uh, done by Affymetrics themselves and published on their website as an uh, experimental data set we should all use for assessing techniques. And that's good AFI data. Um, here is some AFI data from an experiment that we did. And you can immediately see that, number one, you see a higher variability across the, the array much more spatial heterogeneity. You can see big patches that presumably again correspond to um, pooling the samples. And here, you see something really interesting. You're seeing a periodic vertical pattern. And these are successive arrays. And as you go later, the pattern actually gets tighter. And um, our best estimate of this is the scanner getting tired and that the scanner here at the beginning was able to do the entire, um, the entire scan in one go without any um, degradations in signal, whereas here it looks like there's periodic fluctuations as something's going wrong with the scanner. We've seen this before. So with an experiment like that, you can clearly see there's something going on, and it gets worse from one to another. Uh, this experiment had eight arrays, and you can see at the beginning it looks fine, then there's two, four, eight, sixteen, until it ends up like this. So how do you account for that? I hope that convinced you spot quality matters. It's clearly an issue. We just don't really know how to handle the issue. Um, some people have bravely thought about manually flagging spots, and that was done for old CDNA arrays. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of st studies showed that the error rate of manual spot flagging is kind of atrocious. So it's 5 to 10% discordance between um, people doing it in different places. So you won't agree on what's good and poor quality. So I would characterize it like this. Um, it's a huge problem, and I think it's one of the most critical problems facing micros and probably facing all omics technologies, how do we assess in an unbiased, accurate, high throughput manner the quality of our experimental data? How do we do that and incorporate those quality measures into our bioinformatics? At the moment, I do not know of a useful solution for it for microarrays. Uh, I think it's a problem that you should all be aware of, and if useful solution, I think everybody would immediately adopt it, but at the moment, most labs, it might include it, will generally struggle with it and then eventually ignore it as well. I don't think there's an easy solution to that yet. Excuse me. Yes. You showed some problematic cases of uh, arrays. What's the ideal picture that you like? So all of these arrays we used without modification in our analysis. What kind of picture, if I see, I could say, yeah, Everything's correct with this one. We use those. No, no, we use those. I think those were suitable. Those were not the level of deviations that made me drop an array. So uh, one could argue maybe we should have dropped all those arrays. Um, but by my, my mind, one way of knowing if your array experiment was good enough is are you able to validate the results? So from that last AFI experiment I showed you, we validated 18 out of 20 genes, or 19 out of 20 genes by real-time PCR. So 90% validation rate, suggesting the arrays and the combined analysis pipeline didn't introduce a lot of errors. So, um, when you should drop a, a, an array it comes down to really what you're using it for. I'll phrase it this way. Every experiment you just looked at was cell culture or an animal experiment. That's probably not so critical because you're interested in having biological replication and looking at things. If you're using this as a clinical diagnostic and you wanted to be sure that you're going to accurately tell this patient, do you get chemotherapy or do you not? 
then you have to go in and look at it. And I would have dropped every single one of those if those were the clinical diagnostics. But for a question that you've got three biological replicate animals and the noise you believe is not systematic, that level should average out. So what do you mean by going through? So, so the question revolved around AFI and yeah, AFI and a couple of other companies will produce some QC metrics for the the um, data sets. And so, the first thing I'll point out is that they're producing per array, not per spot QC metrics, and they're basically very, very coarse estimates of should you drop or should you continue using this array? There are pretty well-defined thresholds below which I would suggest dropping the array. Uh, however, above those thresholds and in the intermediate range, it's not clear at all how quality of the array and its usefulness relates uh, to, to the QC metrics. So they're useful as a coarse filter for which arrays need to be repeated. But beyond that, I haven't seen any um, reproducible reports of them being useful. Uh, in some cases, if the QC metrics are too low, uh, in some cases, after you will, uh, the cores will repeat them themselves because they immediately look at it and know that it was too low quality. Uh, actually, if they were that way, that's why I'm just thinking what to do with those which are below that threshold, which is point one. Yeah, and, and we can discuss that offline, I guess. All right. So at this point in time, my discussion of pre-processing takes a positive turn because we go from things that are um, very difficult and not very well researched into things that are much easier and very well researched. And there's an interesting correlation between the easier problems having gotten the most steady. Uh, and so the first relatively easy problem is uh, the normalization within an array, so the intra-array normalization. And uh, there's a wide variety of algorithms that have been developed to solve this problem. Um, the idea here is that you'd have an artifact that is specific to a single chip. And it's systematic across that chip. Something like the sample pooling that we saw, or incorrect balancing of your experimental samples, uh, would be classic uh, features that you'd want to remove. And so the, the the way in which you remove these features depends specifically on what feature you're looking at. So for example, if you have an array and you see that superimposed on that you've got some sort of a gradient, a spatial gradient, that immediately makes you go, huh, how do I handle that? Well, there's a technique called a Gaussian spatial smoother. And we're not going to go over the math of it. But very basically, it's designed as a filtering technique in optics to remove exactly this. And if you've got a systematic removal like this, it'll do fine. Imagine that instead this was five different spots of spatial variability. Ah, normalization won't like you too much. But any systematic artifact like that is, is relatively easily handled. I showed you one of the arrays, looked like a sample pooling at the bottom. Uh, this algorithm would have handled it very trivially and removed that effect. There's also the question of channel balancing. What happens if in this case, I have uh, six reds and four greens, so I accidentally pipetted in more of the one sample than the other. Uh, immediately, then the signal intensities for that one are going to be 50% higher. The intensity ratios are going to be more, and it's going to look like every gene is upregulated in one sample. Uh, and then lastly, there's something called intensity bias. And the intensity bias indicates the idea that we're taking a look here this is a homotypic hybridization. So it's, I think my numbers got lost. Um, so this is array one versus array two with the exact same sample on it. And this is zero signal intensity through to the maximum, uh, which is 65,000. And along the middle, we've got the vast bulk of the spots. And we've got a couple of outliers, technical noise, bad spot quality, background issues. 
whatever it is. But the bulk of the spots fall within this sort of one standard deviation, one and a half standard deviation range. But what should be immediately clear enough to you is, take a look over here. The range is about the same at the high signal intensity as it is down here at the low signal intensity. So the variance, or the noise, is not proportional to the intensity of the gene. <coughs> if a gene is present at 100 copies, you've got 10, uh, 100 uh, mRNA mRNA molecules, and you've got a uh, noise of 10, well, that's only 10 out of 100. But if the gene is only present at 10 copies, and you've got a noise of 10, then you've got 100% noise. So this is called the intensity bias. Microarrays have much more noise at the low intensity or at the high intensity, and that needs to be systematically removed because it violates just about the every assumption of every statistical test. Um, and we're not going to talk in great detail about statistics, but uh, if I were to say what are the assumptions of the t-test, I suspect most people would say normality. And that's true. Normal distribution is one of the assumptions of the t-test, that the sample is drawn from a normally distributed population. But it's actually a really weak assumption. The t-test doesn't care if it's drawn from a normal distribution. It can work around that most of the, tape, most of the time. The t-test really cares that there's equal variance. The assumption of what's called skedasticity in statistical testing is critical. And if you think the t-test is, is harsh for that, uh, ANOVAs, or general linear models, are extremely rigid in their assumptions of that. So removing intensity bias is a, another critical factor to allow you to do your downstream statistical testing fairly. So there's a number of algorithms that are useful for each of these. The intensity effects are, are well, do, well removed by uh, lower smoothing. Uh, lower smoothing is a that basically fits a straight line piecewise over small regions of your array. And it will put those piecewise straight lines together in a way that will allow you to smooth out a, a nonlinear shape. Um, when you have multiple effects, techniques based on splines or quantiles are proven effective. So there's a number of different factors that all come down to knowing what are the noise characteristics of your platform and your experiment, which will lead you to decide how you should normalize it. So all these methods are well established, well demonstrated in the literature, and a variety of experiments to work and to improve validation rates. Similarly, you might have multiple arrays, and you want to merge them together. And this is maybe close to the most studied topic in uh, microarray analysis. Uh, it is clearly um, uh, important and there's a number of different techniques that have been developed. The most important application for this is when you've done your experiments at different times. Um, you did half your experiments this year and half of them next year, and you want to merge those together in some sort of a meta-analysis, this will allow you to pool the data in a, a fair sort of way. So it could be caused by things like differential loading, um, by batch effects in your array manufacturer, and the underlying approach is simply to scale the arrays. The distributions, as you can see here, look really similar. It looks basically like they're just offset. They're just shifted over one way or the other. So all you need to do is scale them into a common distribution. There's a number of algorithms that are directly designed to do that. Uh, one of them, in many cases, a simple z-score transformation which is simply subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation works for a large fraction of array experiments. Otherwise, something called a quantile normalization works for a large fraction. So it's extremely easy to handle. And here's a sample data set that you'd look at and go, ah, a lot of noise, huge bias between sample to sample. And after you, let me point out, this is the intensity of spots on the array, and this is the fraction of spots that have that intensity. So it's a smooth histogram called a density plot. And afterwards, you can see that everything looks basically the same. Uh, can anybody immediately look at this experiment and tell me what kind of a micro it was? There's something, two clear features that will tell you what it is, actually. Yeah, so one thing, it's obviously a two-color array, red and green. But the other thing that's more characteristic, see that hump over there? Uh, that's a chip chip experiment. It had an enrichment, and these are the enriched population outside of the main distribution. So that's uh, very characteristic. Anytime you see that, you'll see that it's a, a chip chip or rip chip or something like that. All right. And then at that point in time, we would have removed all the noise, and we can start moving forward to statistical analysis and uh, 
assessing the data set itself to draw meaningful conclusions. And I'm not going to talk for, for hours about statistics, uh, although I would like to. Um, but I'll point out that micro statistics have a lot of really interesting features. There's a lot of things that you can do based on the fact that micro um, have a lot of different variables, they're multivariable, and those variables are highly correlated. And let's talk really briefly about what I mean by multivariable, because that's not a term you've probably heard. In a normal linear equation, you would say that there's an independent variable, x, and there's a dependent variable, y. We will sometimes do multivariate statistical analyses, which means we have multiple x's. So we may be looking at how g expression, the dependent variable, is changed as a function of the dose and time that we've given a specific drug. We'll take a look at how patient survival, the dependent variable, is a function of the stage of the tumor, the treatment, and the age of the individual. Well, those are classic multivariate analyses. This is a multivariable analysis. It means that we have multiple dependent variables, multiple y variables. Every single gene can be treated as a separate variable. And that means we get into a field of statistics that is, in general, not what people are trained or familiar in. Uh, does anybody have a multivariable background, statistics background? Sorry, I should just say, it's the other way around. You're looking at multiple y's that's multivariate. A bunch of X's, that's multivariable. Multiple Y's is multivariable. No, multivariable. Multivariable. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk after, but yeah, it's definitely multivariable. Um, multiple, so multiple dependent variables is multivariable. Uh, but the key point is, um, this opens up a field of statistics that probably most people have no background in. Um, and as a result, with no background in it, most of us don't necessarily know how to do it. And we were course in micro statistics to using instead sequential statistics per gene. Instead of trying to fit a model to the entire data, we say, well, that's pretty complicated. That's something that, frankly, the statistics is often not there for how to do it. On top of that, there's experimental noise. And instead, we're going to focus on doing a separate statistical model for each gene. And so there's a number of different models that you would look at. So very generally, you can divide statistics into a couple of different areas. There's what you might call point estimation techniques, and there's hypothesis testing techniques. And what we're mostly going to focus on is the idea of statistical testing, significance testing. We would take each gene and ask a hypothesis, phrase a hypothesis about that gene, and you would do that for every single gene on your microarray. So to remind you what we're going to be thinking of, we're talking about something like probability. And we're going to be asking, can we assign a p-value that tells us whether this hypothesis is true for a given uh, gene? And we're going to sequentially test that hypothesis one after the other. So there's a number of different questions that you would ask. And they each correspond to a different statistical test that you would apply to uh, your microdata. So for example, you could first ask, are different groups different? If I have uh, control versus treated, uh, drug treated versus experimental control, I would sequentially ask for each gene, is there a difference? I could also ask, is there synergy? If I give two drugs together, is it better than giving them separately? I could certainly ask questions about patient survival, and I could definitely ask questions about predicting clinical features. So off the top of your head, I suspect most people have heard about the statistical techniques to answer at least one and two. So um, we're going to focus in the practical session on number one, the techniques used to assess whether groups are different. The most common, of course, is something like the t-test, but there's lots of others. And uh, if people are interested, uh, then talk to me separately about something about the techniques about patient outcome and treatment differences. And I believe patient outcome we'll be talking about extensively on Friday. So at that point in time, we're going to have a list of genes that you've identified where your hypotheses are met, where there's something interesting about those. And you're going to say, I want to visualize those genes or understand something about their characteristics. So we'll talk briefly about clustering. Clustering is another well-studied problem in, in bioinformatics. And it comes from a field of study called machine learning. So uh, I guess I'll ask a quick question. Who has used machine learning today? <laughs> 
one. Anybody else? Two, three, only three people? All right, how did you use machine learning? Uh, I'm studying computing science. So All right, fine. So he used to do his research. Anybody else? Anybody use it not as part of the research today? All right, you all did. So who uh, saw the weather report today? Anybody use Google? Uh, anybody see an ad on a website? Best recommendations for a book from Amazon. Elevator patterns. These are all applications of machine learning. Machine learning is the technique by which a series of data is processed to make predictions about future behavior. So all of what you've done in many aspects of your life is driven by machine learning algorithms. Computerized trading that, that makes stock exchanges go crazy, machine learning algorithms. So machine learning is a big field and a very, very interesting field. Uh, and we're not going to talk about much of it. We're going to talk about a specific subclass called unsupervised machine learning. It's called unsupervised because it starts off without having any particular information or data about what you're uh, trying to find out. It doesn't know what the patterns are. It says, let's try to learn or discover them. So it's the process of finding patterns in a data set. And each pattern in unsupervised machine learning is called a cluster. Um, it's a very small branch of machine learning. If you get a, a standard upper undergrad textbook on machine learning, it'll be four or five hundred pages, and clustering will be one chapter. So it's a tiny little topic. And uh, I guess I should say that it's a very overused part of it in bioinformatics. Um, we resort to clustering techniques when uh, a formally trained machine learning person probably would not. And there's a number of reasons why we use it, and some of those are good reasons. Um, the first is that it provides pretty pictures, and that's really useful for communicating data. So this is a cluster gram or a heat map. And there's a couple of different portions here. The first at the top is the dendrogram. These dendrograms tell you the linkages between different types of data. The distance to the origin is telling you how close two things are related. So these two, these two columns, are very tightly related to each other. These four are a little less related to each other, but they're much closer to each other than they are to this group of four, which is different from this group of four, which is really different from these eight over here. So there's some sort of a linkage between the distance of, not some sort, there's a very specific mathematical linkage between the length of the arms of the dendrogram and how similar the samples are. Similar could be measured in a couple of different ways, and we'll talk about that. The pretty part here is called the heat map. The heat map itself is typically colored, but there's a lot of different coloring schemes you could use. Um, I'm showing here red-green. Uh, is anybody in the room red-green colorblind? Yeah, one. So that's about right. It's about um, one to five percent of the population is red-green colorblind. And I did this, sorry, as an example of what you should never do. Um, you should never make uh, figures that are red-green because they're really hard to interpret for people who are red-green colorblind. So it's best to take things like red-blue or green-yellow or, or combinations like that. So what does this actually mean? Um, let's, so in this experiment, these are genes. These are samples. And each of these corresponds to the level of that gene in a specific sample. So it's telling us that if red is high, this set of genes is very high in this set of samples, um, but not in any of the other samples. And it allows you to see similarities in groups of genes across samples. That's an interesting thing to look at. There's a number of ways in which clustering is done. And uh, a very simple way of looking at it is to say, if we have two genes, two stimuli, we're going to have, uh, sorry, two stimuli and a number of genes within them. And we want to draw clusters for each of these genes. You can sort of see pretty clearly these four fit together, these five, these three, and that. And our eye can immediately pick out where we think the grouping should go. If you want to teach a computer to do that, it's actually not uh, super challenging to teach the computer. You tell it that there's two metrics it should measure. The first is, what is the distance within a cluster? How tight are these genes to each other? And then second, it measures how far are clusters from each other. A clustering algorithm should minimize the distance within a cluster and maximize the distance between clusters. There's a number of ratio techniques and things that can be done to look at that. So uh, a clustering algorithm is a nice way of visualizing the data based on those different criteria.
Why is clustering used? There's a number of different reasons. Obviously, it's pretty visualization. It's unsupervised machine learning, so it's a nice way of predicting things about your data set. Uh, it can be used biologically to identify co-regulation and also for quality control. And uh, I'm going to stop in a couple of seconds so that we can go for coffee, but I'm um, going to tell a quick story about quality control. In some of the earliest micro-experiments, groups would do a series of experiments on it was yeast at that time, and they would look at the experimental results. And when they clustered them, they found that they had a clustering pattern that didn't correspond to any biology that they could recognize. They couldn't figure out what was going wrong. And so eventually they looked at it and they said, wait, it's clustering according to the technician. So it can be useful as a quality control because what it's finding is the strongest pattern in the data set. You're not telling it what that pattern is. You hope the strongest pattern in the data set is your biology, but if it is not, then it's an interesting thing to find out what's actually going on. So uh, let's stop for a break now. We'll come back, finish talking about machine learning, talk a little bit about the Affymetrix specific analysis pipeline, and then get into some practical work. Okay? All right, so let's get back to it. Uh, does anybody have any questions that they are burning came up over the coffee break? So we were talking about unsupervised machine learning, and I just told you about what it's useful for, and or some of the things that it's useful for, and uh, now let's talk about these in a little bit more detail. So the first I said is uh, data visualization. I think that's pretty obvious. That makes a pretty picture. Uh, and the next one is to predict class assignment. So here's an example, something that would be interesting. Uh, it comes from yeast, but the same work has been done in human. And it basically revolves around the fact that for a large fraction of the genome, we have not much of an idea of what it does. So you could imagine that it would be really nice to be able to estimate the function of all of the genes that we don't really know what they do, and to come up with more refined functional estimates. So a good decade ago, Tim Hughes's group said, this is a, a definitely a solvable problem. We can come up with estimates, and what we're going to do is we're going to run a microarray on um, yeast cells that have had essentially every gene knocked out one at a time, or have been sequentially subjected to a series of chemical stimuli. And we're going to take a look at the genes versus the stimuli, and we're going to try to identify clusters, groups of genes. So you might identify, here are a set of genes that all show reduced expression uh, when the mating has been knocked out, when mating has been impaired, and this set of genes also shows response to Elvisteral, which is a yeast mating, something or other, um, and they show uh, activation of MAPK signaling, and you can imagine that if there were 10 genes in here, nine of whom were known mating response genes, and the tenth of which was an uncharacterized novel gene, what do you think that uncharacterized novel gene does? Probably involved in mating. And so they show very elegantly that you can take a map like this and make quite accurate predictions about gene function for the entire genome. Now, you're going to make mistakes. Just because a gene shows a similar transcriptional response to another gene doesn't necessarily mean it does the exact same thing. Co-regulation is not co But still, it does show that there's good information there. However, um, clustering can be abused in this process very frequently, and it's probably one of the biggest crimes since that bioinformaticians make is inappropriate clustering. The first one is clustering is a pattern discovery technique. It learns new patterns. It's not pattern classification. It's not meant to do predictive work like Google would be predicting what your next query is going to be. It's meant to find the most important signals within a data set. So that means that clustering is supposed to be done on your entire data set. If I go ahead and find the 100 genes in my data set that are related to uh, response to a drug and then cluster those 100 genes only, yeah, well, I'm going to see the response to the drug. That doesn't mean the clustering has told me anything. It just reaffirmed the statistical analysis that I did before. It didn't even reaffirm it. It just showed that I did a statistical analysis. So if you intend to draw any conclusions from your clustering, it has to be done on an unbiased gene set. 
Now, it doesn't have to be done on the entire gene set. Imagine that your clustering algorithm is too slow to work on every single sample. Then you can cluster random subsets of 10% of your data, and you can show that those have the pattern that you're interested in. There's nothing biased about that. But as soon as you introduce a specific experimental bias, then immediately you're going to see that your clustering results lose their ability to tell you anything. Secondly, clustering is not a technique to identify differentially expressed genes. It is not a substitute for proper statistical analysis. So you would go ahead and say, all right, I plotted control and I clustered control and treated samples, and I see a bunch of samples that are red in the control and green in the treated, a bunch of genes, I'm sorry, that are red in the control, green in the treated. So let me look at what those genes are, and those must be the differentially expressed ones. Clustering do that. It's a pattern discovery technique. It's the replacement of statistics. It's well demonstrated, but it's underpowered. It will increase your false negative and your false positive rate relative to even extremely simple statistical techniques like a t-test or a u-test. So even though there's a definite temptation to see oh, those must be the genes that I'm interested in, that doesn't mean that the clustering assessment will return to you a group of genes as reliably differentially expressed as other techniques. It just, it's not a substitute for your standard statistical analysis. <coughs> and lastly, um, clustering is something that gives you a pattern. And I could throw random data at this, these clustering algorithms and they'll give you a pattern. That's what they're going to do. It tries to discover the strongest patterns in your data set. Those patterns are actually meaningful. If you cluster tumors and you see that you had eight patients who responded to drug and eight who did not, and the clustering pattern was five and three versus three and five. Is that random chance or is that an enrichment? Now you need statistics to support whether your clustering showed you anything meaningful. When I told you about the QAQC experiment where um, microarrays clustered according to technician, just looking at it, how do you know if that's real? You need to do statistics to go, yes, the clustering that um, we expect the actual known technician groupings does match what you would have gotten by chance alone. This isn't just a, an assortment issue. <coughs> so in all those cases, clustering is something that you have to think about carefully how you're going to use it. So we've kind of walked through the entire analysis pipeline to this stage. And I want to draw some key points that everybody should be keeping in mind. And frankly, if you forget just about everything that you learned today, these are probably the most key points that you need to think about. First, microdata is analyzed with a sequential pipeline of algorithms. Sequential pipeline of algorithms, that's the workflow. You can't skip a step. The results of one step are critically dependent on the results of the last step. You can't move to the next step until you've optimized the previous one. You have to take things in a careful, systematic, ordered way. And you have to remember each of those steps in the pipeline does something different and requires different choice and different consideration from the analyst. So I mentioned at the beginning that there's not a lot of research into quantitation algorithms. Affymetrics quantitation is almost standard. The way that the company suggests is what we all do. But we make a choice, and you still have to know that. You still have to report that in your manuscripts, and you still have to remember that that has downstream effects on your results. The second point is that this is a very active research area. So I showed you this pipeline. And on this pipeline, I told you about all the research that's going on into steps down here, and all the research that's needed into the steps up here. None of those are things that are in stasis. The best algorithms that we used to analyze a micro three years ago are not entirely different, but changed from what we would use today. And certainly, five years from now, we would probably use different techniques. There would be better improved methodologies, better understanding of the signal of noise, and the technology itself would change in a way that would lead us to do things differently. So this is, this is the first time in the, this course that you've heard this about a, a pipeline. What you're going to hear for every other type of analysis is exactly the same. It's a pipeline of sequential algorithms. That's how you analyze copy number arrays, next-gen sequencing data, proteomics, sequentially with a series of algorithms, and the exact same principles that you've heard me talk about for the last hour and a bit are exactly what you should be thinking about for those as well.
The last thing I want to point out on this, this topic is that you should be thinking about getting very familiar with the bioconductor package or, or library of our packages. <laughs> In different fields, different tools become used for a variety of reasons. Convention, field effects where lots of people get involved in it and, and uh, founder effects. And so I was originally an engineer and we used MATLAB for everything. And I don't today know why. Now that I know better, I realize how many flaws MATLAB as a language has. It's got its good points and it's got its bad points. For bioinformatics, the two, Lingua Franca, are Perl and R. They're the most commonly used languages. And in part, it's because of the existence of very strong open source freely available libraries. And the one best characterized for bioinformatics in R is Bioconductor. Um, it is very well maintained, it's reasonably well funded, and the vast majority of the analyses that we'll talk about use bioconductor packages, and they contain methods for from proteomics, NLPCI data, flow cytometry, and anything like that. And so you should think very carefully about when you want to do something, do I need to do it, or has somebody done it before that I can take advantage of it? Uh, Bioconductor is a pretty user-friendly website, and I guess everybody would have installed it already uh, yesterday or before starting the, the tutorial. So here is where we were going to start for a break, and what we're going to talk about next is Affymetrics pre-processing, what's specific about that workflow, and then we'll look about how we can load Affymetrics data into R, pre-process the data, and compare different pre-processing techniques. so much. Okay, so I showed you the workflow that is generic, that kind of covers every possible situation. Now let's focus it down on what is an affymetric specific. So this is the overall workflow. The first thing we can say is that quantitation is done according to affy defaults with minimal user intervention. Affy does go ahead and tweak things on us sometimes, which means you need to report version numbers in papers. It's, as a reviewer, one of the first things that I'll reject a paper for. I look at the methods, and if there's no version numbers for their software, then it's an irreproducible bioinformatics analysis, and you send it back and tell the editor to get them to put version numbers in before I'm going to review it. Similarly, if the data is not publicly available, we reject it right away and tell the editor to go get them to deposit their data in a public resource, and then you'll review the paper properly for scientific content. These are critical things. Secondly, it's a one-channel array, so there's no Psi 3 and Psi 5, just Psi 3 or, or the actual stain that they do use. Um, spot quality is typically more than most analysis pipelines, but definitely so in Affymetrics. Uh, it's a single-channel array, and in general, simultaneous normalization procedures are being used, one that simultaneously are between and within array normalization. So if we collapse all that and rephrase it a little bit, you get a pipeline that looks like this. We start off with the raw quantitative data, which is in files called cell files, which you need to background correct, normalize, probe set annotation. Remember I mentioned the CDF files earlier. You need to uh, annotate the probe sets, do statistics, clustering, and integration. Okay. So the probe set annotation is something that I want to to spend a little bit of time on. So we talked about it before. The arrays can become outdated. Uh, there's a number of reasons for this. There's the changing gene definitions. Uh, the reference genome sequence that these arrays were based on was not finished. And uh, I guess John yesterday probably talked to you about how difficult it is to define a finished genome sequence. Um, but these ones were really, really not finished. Uh, and so there's a lot of changes. New regions in the genome that were discovered, duplicated regions that were collapsed, and so forth. Additionally, uh, there are many novel splice variants, and uh, some estimates will be 10 to 20 splice variants per gene, and it will often be found that probes will tag one splice variant but not another, and you have to know carefully, should we collapse those together and say they're targeting the same gene? Because they're going to show different results if there's differential splicing, or do we separate them into different transcript definitions? And then, of course, any error that's made in the initial design remains present in all arrays. Arrays are what's called a, a closed platform. And what it means is that you fix at design time what you're going to be assessing. Those are only the things that you can assess. By contrast, in sequencing, it's an open platform. You can find out what you'd like. That's not entirely 
Does anybody know of a way in which microarrays can be made into an open platform where you can assess any species, any single thing on a, a microarray? So there's a technique um, of which it's been academically described, but I don't know the commercial implementation, but they're called universal arrays. Essentially, the array contains every 15 mer that's possible on the array. And that way, you can hybridize any sample to it, and if you do appropriate normalization and deconvolution, you can pick apart any single sequence or any single uh, gene in any species. As long as it's got a unique 15 mer tag is the, the key question. But that's actually a pretty nice technique. Um, and in theory, it would be able to do everything that you could do with sequencing on a single array. If the arrays could be more dense, you could get up to 17 or 18. And at that level, it's actually practical for human genome work. Um, at lower levels, it's perfect for things like bacteria and so forth. So all right. The, the reason why AFI does not come out, or any company really, does not come out with a new array every six months is because the array design is expensive. In fact, the two really expensive things in making these arrays are the collimator and the mask. And you can sort of see, you're going to need a lot of masks. So at a minimum, you're going to need um, 100 masks because every base pair you're going to build up one at a time and you've got four possible nucleotides. So you're going to need a minimum of 100, although in some cases, based on design characteristics, you may not want to have a square of four arrays together, of four spots together, one, two, three, four, because that will allow the light to shed out a little bit more, and that diffraction can cause noise. So it actually will take more than that. So 100 minimum masks. These masks are expensive to produce time-consuming and expensive. So they want to get high reuse. So that's one of the reasons. The second reason is that bioinformaticians uh, can be occasionally unwilling to change and move to new technologies and say, well, you know, this one was working. I don't want to have to worry about how I integrate the old and the new array data. Think about all the bioinformatics challenges, batch effects, do another validation experiment to make sure I trust your new array platform. And as a result, AFI's best-selling array remains a 10 or 11-year-old product. Why? For exactly the reason. When my collaborators go, we need to do an experiment, I'm like, oh, you use U133 plus 2. Why? Because I know how to analyze the array. We're familiar with the signal-to-noise characteristics. And it's easy to integrate with all the data that we've already done and other sorts of other experiments and platforms. So there's advantages to that. Of course, the disadvantage is that we're continually working with older data. And so that leads you to saying, well, can we take advantage of the idea that there are multiple probes? And I mentioned in there that you've got 11 probes per gene, or 10 probes per gene on average. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. What I didn't mention about affymetrics arrays is that in the original version of the array way back in, in 97, um, these 25 base pair sequences were all designed with a paired control. A paired control where the 13th base pair, the middle base pair, was mutated. And the other 24 base pairs were identical. The idea is that this mutated base pair would provide you a really good assessment of nonspecific hybridization. It would give you a really good measure of any background that was binding to that same sequence. And it's a pretty good idea. So the exact matching probe is called the PM, perfect match. And the one with that mismatch in the middle, is the 13th base pair, is called the MM, mismatch. Uh, and the PM and MM probes need to be aggregated together in some sort of a useful and clever way to make sure that you can uh, take advantage of that information. The challenge is, well, actually, who knows what the challenge is? Why, what's wrong with MM probes? Guesses? In case there's a SNP, good. Yep. Right. If there's a SNP in that location, it'll definitely be a big, big problem. What else? Could hybridize specifically, even though it has a mismatch. Could hybridize specifically to what? The, the thing is, the, the perfect match hybridizes to just a little less. Mm -hmm. So the differential affinities may not be strong enough. Definitely true. What else? There's at least two other things that go wrong here. So one is, 
That's true, but why? So one thing is, what happens if the mismatch probe exactly matches another region of the genome? So that is by far the most common problem. And I told you a few slides ago that we didn't know the exact definition of the genome at the time that AFI designed these. So now when you go ahead, you find that large fraction, I think it's about 30%, of mismatch probes perfectly match something else. That's not so useful because now what happens is when you, when you find it, what you were seeing as pure signal, all perfect match and no mismatch, you're going to see as no signal mismatch binding. So what happens if um, there's a SNP in the perfect match probe and there's a SNP in the mismatch probe? Same location, uh, say the 20th base pair. Now the perfect match will bind at 24 out of 25 and the mismatch will be bind at 23 out of 25. Are you going to be able to distinguish that difference accurately? Sure, 25 out of 5 versus 24 out of 25, that's a big difference in affinity. But 23 versus 24, uh, I don't know. So they can often cause big, big problems in your ability to detect things. So today, we normally exclude the mismatch probes. In fact, the CDF mapping algorithms that I described earlier actually treat the mismatch probes as if they're regular probes, usually. It's going to go and take every 25 base pair, perfect match or mismatch, and see if they can find any place on the genome that this could be used to interrogate something. And that means some things that were never designed in as part of the array are now interrogatable because of the mismatch probes. So it's trying to maximize the use of the data. That being said, um, I kind of talked about this, like the company really doesn't want to go ahead and uh, um, give you more uh, new versions of arrays. That's not true. I mean, uh, they certainly have released new products. It's just they don't get as wide use. So there's an Exxon array, which doesn't get particularly wide use. Um, there's what are called the gene arrays, which are kind of an updated version of the, the classic uh, expression arrays with more normal product definitions. And maybe most importantly and interesting for, for everybody here, um, in January, February, a paper was published in PNAS about an array that they co-developed with Stanford. And basically, it's a hybrid exon, non-exon array. Uh, it's a nice product in the sense that it's, in theory, covers a larger fraction of the transcriptome, which is better known today, but tries to maintain compatibility in some ways with some of the older arrays. Most importantly, it's pretty validated in FFP samples. It's been shown to work. So in theory, that's what they would hope would be the next flagship product. But as uh, John would have mentioned yesterday and Anne is going to mention on Friday, one could question in 10 years if anybody would be using a microwave for that kind of experiment. Maybe the right thing to do at that point is just to sequence everything. So companies like this are in an intermediate transition stage, and that actually makes it difficult for a company to draw in substantial bioinformatics expertise. Uh, would I rather spend the next year working on algorithms for a new microwave platform, or would I rather spend it on algorithms for RNA-seq development? One is probably going to have a better long-term payoff. So there's some challenges with that. And that, again, comes back to why this probe set remapping is critically done. So I mentioned the CDF file. And now that I've done that, you can, you can sort of see the other files here that come out of an AFI experiment. Um, one that we didn't discuss is the first one, the DAT file. The DAT file is just a TIFF image. It's the actual raw image reflecting your micro experiment. Uh, it gets processed, quantitated using the AFI default algorithm into the cell file. And the cell file, although sometimes it's in a compressed format, but basically it's just a table of locations x-coordinate, y-coordinate, signal intensity, and covers every single on the array in that way. All right. And we'll talk a little bit about AFI-specific pre-processing. So let's think about this again. What exactly is pre-processing? I talked about it a little bit this morning, but we already have a specific one-line definition that they would use after what we just discussed. Yep, yep, I would have just said removing technical noise, but yep, that's exactly right. So pre-processing is removing any noise from the data set. And so that means that, of course, you've got to think about where the technical noise comes from. So where would you find the technical noise in an AFI data set? Yeah. 
Well, you could have batch effects from one wafer to another. You could have effects that are related to the individual features or effects that are related to the hybridization and scanning. And so you have to look at each of the individual steps and ask what could happen, what could go wrong. And those will reflect what you're going to do in your analysis. Um, so as an example, you've got an in vitro transcription and a, an RT and an IVT for each sample. And that means they could be different from one sample to another, which means that probe affinities or um, probe uh, biotin labeling could be different from one to another, and that would lead to systematic differences. Uh, hybridization could vary and so forth. So when we come up with a, a, an analysis pipeline, we're going to try to remove all of the things. What are the factors that could have caused technical noise? And uh, one thing that's worth pointing out is the second last line. Uh, hybridization of is wow. hybridization is greatly affected by ozone levels. Uh, it's pretty well known that the uh, environmental ozone levels can really, really mess up um, the fluorescence of certain dyes. The ozone scavenges the dyes and causes free radical reactions, chain reactions actually, that um, can prevent you from seeing any signal. And back in the mid 2000s, um, the lab that I did my PhD in gave up on doing micro experiments in the summer because ozone levels in Toronto were too high, and we were just losing one out of every two, one out of every three experiments because of insufficient signal. That's not the kind of thing you'd immediately guess. And the UHL Micro Center in the other tower of Mars has an ozone-free room for doing parts of its hybridization and analysis procedures. That's not something that you immediately go, oh, I got a control for that. But actually, if you happen to know the ozone level of every sample, you would incorporate that into your normalization. And you'd say, OK, this was done on a day where environmental ozone was x. Therefore, I'm going to scale everything to the ozone level and, and bring them all to a consistent basis. So those kind of things really require you to know your technology. I've said that a few times. And there's no reason not to if you don't be able to do the, the analysis correctly. I just said is to remove technical noise. It is not a substitute for designing your experiment properly. You don't do like a really poorly designed experiment and then say, OK, but I'm going to use normalization to clean it up. The point of normalization is to remove whatever you couldn't remove with experimental design. So as an example, there's some basic experimental design principles that you should always keep in mind. You should balance experimental groups. So imagine that you were going to be doing 100 arrays. Uh, let's call it 100 arrays, yeah? And that your array center did them in batches of 10. And that means it's going to take them two weeks. And you had 50 arrays from uh, patients with cancer type X and 50 patients with a different cancer subtype Y. Uh, the worst possible experimental design is on week one to do the 50, 50 patients with cancer type X and on week two the 50 patients with cancer type Y. However, I would go out on the limb and say that at least half of the core facilities in North America, if you just gave them all your samples, they're not going to randomize them for you. I mean, why would they even think of it? So you'd have to either tell them or pre-randomize them yourself and think of this kind of a feature. And yet it's clearly established that there's systematic processes that occur over time array experiments. And it's obvious what would go wrong. So you should always be not only uh, thinking about that proactively, about balancing your groups, but making sure you've recorded those groupings so you can test to see if they're group-specific effects. If you have a choice, and there's not always a choice, um, it's much better to do biological replicates than technical replicates. So if you have a, a only money to do 20 arrays, and you wonder, should I do 10 arrays of treatment type X and 10 arrays of treatment type Y, each from a different patient? Or should I do five, but two, two replicate arrays from each patient? It's always better to do 10. The, uh, no, always. In the vast majority of cases, it's better to do 10. And the reason for that is the technical uh, bias will already be incorporated into the biological replicates. They still have that technical source of error. So you're going to be able to simultaneously assess biological variability and technical variability. And that allows you to increase your power and, most importantly, increase your generalizability.
What you really care is, are my results true? Not true for this one sample, are they true in general? And if you have a smaller number of biological replicates, you diminish the, the ability to see that. There are exceptions. Imagine I'm developing a clinical diagnostic. Then I really care, are they true for this one patient? Or imagine that I have lots of money but a limited number of samples. Okay, then you would do technical replicates. But in general, biological replicates would be preferred. Uh, and then lastly, imagine that it's not possible to um, process experimentally your samples identically, that that's not a practical thing, then it's critical to introduce controls. So let me give you an example. Imagine that I get a grant from somebody. Michelle, did you want to give me a grant? Okay. So Michelle gives me a grant to do 100 micro experiments. Thank you. And um, I'm going to, unfortunately, she says, well, Paul, these are expensive. So I can only afford to give you 50 this year, today, and 50 next year. And I say, wow, that's a bit of a pain. So my experiments are going to have to be physically separated in time by a whole year. That's going to introduce a source of bias. Yes, I would make sure that I would balance my experimental groups. But the other thing I would do is I would take some experiments and make sure they're done in both years. So instead of doing 100 experiments, Michelle would only get 90 experiments worth with 10 replicated in each year. And that is a much more preferential experimental design because now I can have a way to control for that batch effect. So you have to think, when there is something that is going to be systematically different in your experiment, what experimental control can you tell whomever is doing the experiment to include so that you can actually analyze the data better? I mentioned this morning, if your controls are frozen and your experiments are formal and fixed, then it makes sense to say, okay, can we get some formal and fixed controls? Doesn't have to be a large number, but enough to be able to systematically identify what the source of error is and how big it's going to be. So, obviously you aim for perfect, balanced, and highly replicated experimental designs, but when you can't, you build those controls directly into the experiments to assess sources of variability. So, I'm not going to go in great depth over the pre-processing techniques used for after experiments, in part because half of you aren't dealing with microarray data, and in part because the half of you that are are going to be dealing with a bunch of different platforms. Um, but I want to mention them so that when you work with them this afternoon, you'll get a feel for what the differences are. So I'm not necessarily describing for you here the two best algorithms. I'm describing the two most commonly used. The two that, if a reviewer saw, they would probably just go, uh, okay, fine. I'm not going to think about it too much. They may not go, oh yeah, this person clearly thought about this for six years, but at least it's reasonably accepted by the community. So those two algorithms are RMA for robust multi-array and MASS-5 for microarray analysis suite version 5. I uh, have to look at that. So they're very, very different algorithms that were developed around the same time. In some sense, they were both um, uh, inspired by the fact that there was an AFI algorithm called MASS-4, uh, which was based on an average difference calculation. It doesn't really matter how it works, but it had a lot of statistical naivete to it that led several very, very good biostatisticians look at it and go, wow, we can do better than that. At the same time, the company looked at it and said, yeah, that was probably dumb. We can do better than that, too. And so two different algorithms got published at the same time that approached how to analyze Affymetrics data in different ways. Um, mathematically, they're not trivial. They both include techniques that people are probably not um, uh, highly familiar with, like a median polish as an algorithm to centralize data and to, to aggregate linear trends. Um, but in essence, despite their differences, they come up with reasonably correlated results. And they each have strengths and weaknesses. So the first is that they have a precision accuracy trade-off. So in MASS-5, it yields very, very um, accurate results. And by accurate, what I mean is that the true mean is very likely a good reflection of the underlying truth. However, the results are not necessarily precise, and by that I mean that there will be higher variability around that true mean. RNA goes the other way. 
it says that it's going to be highly precise, that the technical replicates are going to be very close, but they may not actually be on the true mean. They may be off of it. And you can argue for which is a better approach when you want it to sacrifice. I'm not saying that MAS5 has absolutely zero uh, precision and that RMA has perfect precision. There's some sort of a variance bias trade-off there of which one is going to yield more of one and less of the other. The general consensus is that RMA, because it has greater precision, does a much better job in small n experiments, in small replicate experiments. The idea is that if you have few replicates, then you don't have a lot of statistical power. And if you artificially increase the noise, like you might with something that will be accurate, but will have a lot of um, uh, uh, bias or variance, then you will start to diminish the number of true results that you're able to see. So the argument, which is reasonably well accepted, is that uh, RMA will work much better for low replicate studies, and MAS5 will work better for, for higher replicate studies. Uh, MAS5 also has a couple of characteristics that allow it to work on a single array at a time. And this is critical. A uh, single array at a time means that you are going to be able to uh, take a look at your um, individual patient one at a time and say, all right, I'll analyze the next patient who comes in the door. Next one, next one. And that makes it much more amenable to clinical diagnostics. By contrast, RMA does not have that characteristic. It needs to work on groups of samples together, and that can make it much more difficult to transfer into a uh, clinical diagnostic. So we'll start off this afternoon working, right uh, now, working with um, RMA, but uh, in the afternoon we'll get to take a look at MASS-5.